that person, they haven't been kicked in the nutsack by life yet. You are listening to the bomb hole. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. The bomb hole. going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another episode of The Bomb Hole. We're back in the booth with Stony Buds. What's happening? Uh, I was at my local Sevy last night. The word is there's squatters in Bells Canyon. You go up there. They will uh, take offense and try to steer you clear of the canyon. So uh, hikers beware around Bell's Canyon. Okay, nice little PSA <laughs> really? from Stony Buds today. Uh, today we have our most heavily requested guest, I think. We got Jeremy Jones in the building. What's going on, Jer? Man, not much. Um, thanks for the request. That's kind of a little overwhelming, you know. I saw that on the Patreon email I got. Uh, I said that I was heavily requested. and Heavily. That's... Uh, you know, thank you. I'm looking at my notes here, and uh, you have a incredible journey. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, but before we get into everything, do you want to kind of briefly paint us a picture of what your childhood looked like growing up? I grew up in Farmington, uh, just north of here. Uh, just normal kid life, I think. You know, dad was going to work all the time. Uh, Mom was raising nine kids. Uh, there's two younger than me, one adopted Korean brother that I got. He's a stud, David. And, uh, you know, just pretty normal. Got into skating, uh, seventh grade, and seventh, eighth grade. And from a skateboard my brother got from Christmas, actually, I just sort of inherited it and started skating. It was a Salba and that ultimately led me into snowboarding and finding out what that was and it was I actually just turned that skateboard into a snowboard by taking the trucks and wheels off throwing bike tire over the top like little stirrup straps and just bombing my buddy's hill there in in Somerset Farms in Farmington and you know normal kind of life I guess middle class life um you know support from my parents to some degree we could get some things, had to work for most, you know, just pretty average, I would say. And, and yeah, and then I just sort of found snowboarding and then that just redirected everything. I just started chasing that and then everything was affected by it. School, family, friends, you know, everything went, it spawned from that. Right. So that was always the base. Still is, still is. So just to run that back, did I hear that correctly? You're, there's nine people in your family or there's nine, you have nine siblings. I have nine siblings. Holy <laughs> shit, dude. Yeah. So we're we're a pretty stacked posse. Um, my parents split when I was ten and then so that I mean that was different. You know, I had I had divorced parents. I grew up with that. So that's you know, there's some trauma there, I think, and you know, and, and I don't know, I guess running, like there was that kind of run from it element, you know, and which I'm thankful for it because it led me again to skateboarding and, and snowboarding, which is what I love the most. Well, one thing that's pretty cool too is the fact that a lot of people know you have a pro career as a, as a snow, as a snowboarder, but you're incredible at skateboarding. And was there, was there a point where you were going to pursue skateboarding before snowboarding? Uh, I think I would wanted to, uh, I definitely was a goal as soon as snowboarding came online, I, I just knew I was closer to that, I think. But yeah, skateboarding was, is definitely that thing that I never got. I didn't pull it off and, you know, I didn't chase the dream totally, but I hoped for it and I, and I got better because I wanted to get better and I skated with rippers, you know, there was so many good skaters around here and It was just a matter of keeping up with them and and doing what I could to keep them stoked and play my part in that crew, right? And all that just got me better, you know, to to what I got, which was not even close to being a pro. But And you had a best friend growing up, Shane Justice, who we lost. He was maybe could have became a pro skater back then. I know you skated with him. Yeah. He was really good. He was one of the best kids around that I had always heard. Yeah. Um yeah, Shane was, I mean, he's a legend, you know, around these parts, and 
RIP and he, yeah, he was, he's, yeah, just, uh, all of that, all of that. He was one of my best skate buddies, you know, in the older years where we were filming parts and, uh, went through first two years of my marriage were pretty rough. You know, we get, you get married, you don't know what to expect or what you're in for. Really. You just know that you normal life, you go and get married and then you have kids, right? If you're kind of patterning that and, and I was just sort of on that path. I knew I always wanted a daughter, even before I knew I wanted a wife. Um, and I just didn't know how I was going to get there when it was going to come. Then it started linking up. And and marriage was hard, dude. I was filming snowboarding. You know, we were pinned at that time. That was like towards the end of forum-ish. And we were just pinned. And that was hard for my wife to adjust to. She didn't know snowboarding. She didn't grow up in it. She didn't grow up in skating. She didn't know what that that passion looked like and I just you know we were going through a rough time and in that two years I hooked up with Shane so back to him and and we just skated like we just skated our lives out and he was he was in a phase that I was unaware of um and which ultimately led him to to his death but you know in those two years it was me and him just filming and we were we were just all about it you know how like let's get some money and film let's film some stuff let's film whatever and and then we were putting video parts out with dirty hessians a little local skate video andy pitts respect brother did a good job out here and yeah and then i had a video part and a couple of those and there was one dedicated to him called loco i was his uh his graffiti was loco fuck that was l-o-c-o f-u-k yeah and it was, tag. yeah, <laughs> it was a, a sick tag and it was big block letters. And, um, you know, we had a lot of good jokes and we just had a lot of fun, man. That was, that was my dude with skating for sure. And he was definitely a Salt Lake legend. Yeah, man. Losing him must have affected you in a major way. I imagine at and that what, age. And what age exactly too? Did you say? Uh, that would have been 24, five, 24, 25, six, and right in there. Yeah, he's, I, you know, it'd be nice to have him around, but he's, you know, he's always there, truly. Like, I, I feel Shane, I, I do tricks, and, and Shane's in my head, like, clear as day. I can, I can, it's like I'm feeling what he must have felt when he's doing a trick. Like, it kind of connects with me that way, and and skating, you know, it's been a part that's kept skating with me, and that drive to always get back on my skateboard is is heavily attached to that, you know, more than I even think now that we're talking about it for sure that's cool okay well i was gonna kind of keep things moving since we have so much stuff to cover and talking about the formate that's obviously a big thing that comes up and for some people some listeners might not know they might be too young exactly what the formate was and essentially you guys were pretty much the biggest crew the most it was almost like a boy it was like band. a boy band like you guys say. were larger than life and um, basically, kind of in that era when you guys were getting flown around the world, you're the biggest names in snowboarding. Can you paint a picture of like what that looked like? You know, that time period in your life. That's a vague, loaded question, but well, it was a blur to some degree because we were just pinned, man. We were doing our thing, like we were we were snowboarding. You know, we we came into it. Me and JP, we grew up together. Uh, from ninth grade, we became homies and. And started snowboarding together. You know, we had a little group, Farmington Crew is what people would call us up here. And there was a handful of us, and I think four of us went pro. And then me and JP obviously stayed in longer than everyone else. But um, we were just going, dude. It was like we were just doing our thing. I almost didn't even see it. I mean, it was we had that support, and we'd roll up, you know, to Europe and do these premieres, and it was – bonkers dude like I didn't understand it I was like how did these people know who we are (laughs) you know we've done one video or not even done a video yet you know before in the early forum eight we hadn't even done our team videos yet and we still had that kind of larger than life thing going and yeah it was it's hard to explain dude it was I I didn't get a look at it from that perspective I was just there I was in that on the stage essentially and 
And so it was just keeping up. It was keeping up with everyone around me um, and just trying to be a value to that, to that process. And so, yeah, it was, it always tripped me out, you know, when going to Japan and there's some crazy premiere and people are handing me their babies and telling me to sign their babies' foreheads. <laughs> and there's, you know, dads on their knees with their babies in their hands and they're crying at my feet, you know, of, of how much like admiration they have for us. And like that, was, that stuff was like, I don't, I don't understand what, this is nuts, dude. You know, I, I didn't get it. And so it was almost like I put on this, this, or I guess threw up a wall of sorts and just said, all right, I'm just doing my thing. I can't get too attached to this stuff because it's just too intense. Like this, I'm just, I'm with you, dude. Like I'll get on my knees with you. Like I'd much prefer that than you kneeling in front of me. This is crazy, you know, and no, I'm not going to sign your boobs. No, I'm not going to sign your face. Definitely not going to sign your kid's face. Like I just, to me, I didn't, you know, that wasn't showing respect to people and humanity. Right. And I've never been the best at that, I guess I've, I've had my mistakes, but you know, that was just, I could just see these lines that I just would build that I wouldn't cross. Right. But it was wild. It was a nuts a nuts time. I look at it now and I, that's when I get to kind of look at it from the perspective that you, you brought the question up, you know, it's like, Oh, we were kind of like a boy band, you know, as you put it. And that's crazy. It's crazy to hear 40 year olds now come up to me and share their experience of that. And I can connect with them now finally. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. Let me, let me look at it from your lens with you here. And that's been pretty fun for me nowadays. You guys were kind of like the Beatles of snowboarding, yeah. basically. I saw you. I was in Japan at some of those events or where we'd all remember back in the day where they'd have everyone at one event or, and we'd all be in the same hotel. I remember seeing the forum aid, people just going crazy, lined up to sign you guys. And it was definitely larger than life. I could imagine what it was like for you. It's cool, yeah, cool just, to hear your perspective of it. And sign my baby. Right. Sign <laughs> and that's baby. a real thing. People yeah, wanted real you thing. to sign the baby. Absolutely. And tears, you know, just lots of tears, dude. I'm like, what, what are you crying? They're just like, so why happy. Are you crying? Yeah, like Beatles right fans here. used to do that. The girls would just start crying when they saw the people and they actually did that. It doesn't happen anymore. That's why it's so interesting. Yeah. That's definitely an interesting thing to talk about. That level of stardom doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't. It Even may, in Japan, it, everywhere. It's just the, the way you didn't know about people's lives with social media. They weren't relatable. I felt like that the way... You guys were more private. Maybe it, it mm. put you guys on more of a pedestal somehow. Or, yeah. you know, it, you, it made you guys not human, kind of. Yeah, everyone's know? so accessible Like, social now. media humanizes people. Without that, you guys were just juggernauts of sorts. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. That that disconnect was, was something you don't have access to anymore, for sure. We're just too exposed, all of us, right? Even from the get-go. Like, you start something, it's you're exposed, you're blown out to everyone. I think I heard someone say it's almost like was it just yesterday maybe on a podcast, maybe Rogan or something. And it was he just said, you know, you're you're almost living a movie star lifestyle like it was in the thirties immediately because you have that at those that access to those people immediately just by s- signing up an Instagram account, you know, or a Facebook. Like all of a sudden there's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people looking at you, and you're already a star, and all you did was sign up. You know, it's an interesting thought, just an off-subject. I was thinking about my childhood. In the 4 one snow video, you had a day in the life, and I remember you had a box of snowboards show up in the mail, and you opened it up, and I think you said, you're like, I know it's a pretty good day when the box shows up, and <laughs> and you go through, and it's like, I don't know, 10 snowboards, and I was just like, this is fucking incredible the boxes of snowboards show up like this is the life this is, that was like the only little thing you peeled back and got to see another side of somebody now you see somebody eating cocoa puffs for breakfast <laughs> on their gram and you know everything about them but i remember you know too much that. about yeah. them for sure <laughs> kind of a cool yeah game. man those and those boxes even still are the best thing like True. dude a box of 10 boards shows up doesn't happen anymore but <laughs> dude that was so rad and we'd use them. You know, it's like, yo, I'm through those 10. I need 10 more. <laughs> and then with those 10, we would get, you know, 
10 of each article that was in the catalog. You know, it was like boxes and boxes would show up. And that was, that was, you know, different times. That was crazy, though. That was Back fun. when the UPS man was called the Brown Santa. The Brown Santa. <laughs> so up with all uh, for sure. J2 used to call that. <laughs> I was skipping through Rob Mathis' book, Slide. Last night, and there's a lot of photos of the Forum 8, and man, you guys crushed it, too. It's, oh, thank you. You guys were well-deserved um, as far as the marketing behind you guys. You guys had the skill to back it up, and I guess that's why they were freaking out the way they were in Japan. Did you guys all get along back in the day when you were cruising together? Or were you, like, best friends and uh, ride together a lot during uh, the filming? I wouldn't say best friends. I think there was best friends intertwined in inside it. You know, um, everyone got along for sure. Uh, there was different phases of hazing, you know, this side or that side. You know, we'd 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 haze the Canadians a lot, um, and then they'd haze us a lot. We'd tease them about their the, the cliff size. You know, it was always like forty feet, dude. You got to that cliff's like fifty feet. It's like a fifty footer. I'm like Canadian fifty footer or U.S. fifty footer because that's like twenty feet at Brighton. <laughs> Just saying. You know, so we, we kind of had that, that dialogue and, um, you know, we teased Bjorn a little bit, uh, cause he was here and, and he was sort of the, I don't know, I wouldn't call it not, I can't use that word cause that's going to sound way wrong than, than what I'm trying to portray. But like we loved Bjorn, but he didn't grow up with us. And so me and JP had this connection that Bjorn didn't have in that crew but we, uh, us three were always running together because we were out of the same hub, you know? And so there was some, you know, we again, we'd just kind of team up and, and tease Bjorn maybe more than we should have. But he was always good about it, and he'd, he'd fire back at us. And, um, you know, I, I think our dynamic in the Forum 8 was on point. Everyone was was down for everyone. We all wanted it to be. We all wanted it to go. And we all wanted each other to get theirs, you know? And you did. It's a wild dynamic to think about the ownership, too. And, you know, Mac Dog had a part of owning it. He was making the videos and the whole, like, just machine behind what is the Forum 8. But we were speaking yesterday, and you mentioned an incredible kind of lesson you learned after you had filmed for decade and in the editing bay for technical difficulties. Do you want to kind of dive into that? Yeah. Um, Yeah, just a good video part lesson. Uh, I, you know, I filmed some skating. We filmed each other all the time, but we'd never built a video part on that level. Uh, JP stepped into Simple Pleasures with MDP and crushed it, right? Right out of the gate. We did some whitey kind of beta testing video parts. Um, I mean, in retrospect, right? Like it was all in for us then, but, and I, I was battling some injuries in that, in those two years. And so I watched JP just apply this formula that we didn't even really know existed, but somehow he had something in his head that he wasn't sharing even with me. And I don't know that he had fully, I can't speak for him. So I don't know that he had it totally programmed in his mind once he had that chance. But me and him went out with Dogger one day um, it was the first time it was kind of like Dogger and Peter came to Salt Lake and we went out with them. It was just me and JP. We went out by the cooler. We call those jumps in back, uh, bright in there. MFM jump. MFM jump. And we went back in that zone and, and I, I couldn't snowboard. I just put on the worst showing. Right. And JP put down the heat and that was in front of Peter and Mac dog. <laughs> So I'm not looking that sweet right out of the gate. And that year moves on, JP's gone. I didn't like it was like two weeks later, he got invited on a trip with MDP as new the new forum kind of poster boy under Peter. And that was that. I saw him in the spring. I didn't see him for two and a half months. And then he drops that simple pleasures part and it was mind numbing, you know? And so then I'm feeling a little better uh, rehabbing and getting better over the summer. And then we go into technical dip or I guess we did decade. I did a good decade year. Um, not what I wanted, but we had a good year. And then we, and then my back acted up again and I was about 18 months out 
and then then got into technical diff and I came in late to film that went to New Zealand thought I was crushing right like put down a bunch of footage um makeup footage like I got to get a part in this thing and then we go to the edit room with Dogger in Tahoe it's just I mean it's like this it's it wasn't this pimp you know it was like a lofty loft in a garage just tiny had his desk in there and he he's we start reviewing my footage and I had you know quite a few minutes seven eight minutes of footage raw footage 16 mil and he stripped that thing down to like 30 seconds in in like a heartbeat and I was like really dude I got three minutes footage here easy like you can't just and me and him got into it it got heated you know and which was weird because I I wasn't in a place to be flexing on dogger you know and and but I was I was flexing on him and I was pissed and put in all that work and and he's just like dude I don't I don't know what to tell you but just come sit down so I sat down next to him and he just started spinning footage and he's like, you need the direct comparison. Let me show you. And he, he did it, you know, trick for trick with JP basically. And he's like, look at JP's timeline. Look at these tricks. Look at the quality. Look at what's happening here. Like you, your stuff's not that it's bad. It's just that the, you know, the refinements aren't there. You're not dialed in that way. And and he was totally right. You know, I was putting down some similar tricks. I was putting down even tricks that would pack even a little bit more heat. But if I didn't, if I didn't stomp it right or land it clean, or I just thought I landed it and I didn't see it until that footage came back, you know, he's like, dude, if you land it and there's one question in your mind, he's all, you need to do it more because you don't know. That's your shot. When you're on film, that's your shot. Cause you're going to see this transfer in two months and then you're going to notice that you drag a hand and that's not going in. And he was that strict, you know? And, and so that was, it was a really good lesson. And so from then on, I was just, you know, we made our beef and, and, uh, settled it. And, and he had my back from then on because I put in, I put in and he saw it and, and I'd pass on that information to the kids that would come in underneath us. And he saw that too. And so he, he just kept bringing us in and, and wanting us in the videos because he knew we would, we'd put out, you know. And then we're sitting on 19, 20, 25 minutes of raw footage on film. And we're stripping that down to three minutes, you know. And, like, that became our thing. Let's see how much raw we can get. And so it was like, let's see how much usable raw we can get. And that's, that was, became the thing you didn't have 15 minutes of raw footage you maybe had a part <laughs> you know so obviously you took dogger's advice because when you fast forward to your resistance part you fucking went dummy and there's some funny things i want to talk about with that because that part was damn near 20 years ago now and you know in that part you have like shirtless back nine on on uh, up in the valley of the cornices you know and you have like these huge cliff shots at brighton and nowadays, I see somebody, oh, like I said, almost 20 years later, go to those same features, go smaller. True. And people are like, holy shit, that was incredible. Do you sometimes feel like, you know, in some directions, you look at the guys, that they're, they're pushing the envelope, but it almost feels like in some directions, it's taken a step back at times in, when I watch those old videos. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I have to answer yes, because it, I, I can't say I haven't had those thoughts. There's been times for sure that I've had them more intense than I, I don't, I don't think I think of it like that anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean that again, I think I'm going to throw that back to Dogger because if you, if you have a director and a filmer and you know that that's their stance, then why would you do anything less? Like if you knew it was less then you're, it's just not a made trick when you get back in the truck or the car and head home. Right. Like, so I don't know. I mean, everyone's going to do their thing. I think, I think it evolves differently. I don't think the evolutions necessarily has to be a better trick off of the same cliff. You know, I think it can be a lesser trick in terms of technicality, but you know, was the style on point? Maybe they just, you know, a big method on the val and on the shirtless McTwist Nine hit 
you know, a big method that's like six feet higher than that McTwist 9 was and fully clothed and tons of style. <laughs> fully clothed. You know, like. I don't know. You might dock a couple for that, though. I might dock. dock you might fully clothed. Clothed. Docking points on that. <laughs> you know, you, and you might, but it, it, like to me, it's, you know, that's that's just as valuable of a trick because there's, you know, there's, first of all, straight airs are hard. Straight, really big straight airs are hard. And. And then to style one out and have it, have it be, you know, something impressive. I I just think that's that's an evolution of it, you know. And even though a method's been done and a styling method's been done, I mean, Jamie Lynn coined that years ago, and and that's that, you know. He's Jamie Lynn's the method. It's yeah. just that simple. No True. gloves, Jamie Lynn method. Like don't. Don't mess with it otherwise. Like you're a goofy footer too, so that even speaks yeah, more to you. I'm goofy footer. I've probably footer. shot that Valley of the Cornices jump like every year for the past twenty years, and I've definitely seen that bigger method. Maybe Eric Leon a couple years ago. Mm. Seen Hans do like some amazing double. I don't even remember what he did, but I've also been there and seen people go so much smaller. So I know exactly what you're talking sure. about. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, and to those to those small air guys and girls. I don't want to leave anyone out here. Come on, throw some heat at him. <laughs> Haley actually no. went pretty big on it. Haley did? Haley Langland, yeah. Oh, that's good. Good for her. She's boss. But, you know, I, I don't know. Small, yeah, I don't know. It's just different, different times. You know, ask me this question 10 years ago, you would have got a way different way answer. Way different answer, maybe. Well, can you just tell us the story of why the shirt came off yes. on the back nine? That's what I want to know. That photo is amazing, too. It's right <laughs> well, over thanks. your shoulder. In the, yeah, and looked at Rob that Mathis for a minute. Photoed it. Yeah, Mathis photo. Um, yeah, it was a good crew. JP, we, Heine, we shoveled that thing out. Um, Kearns was there filming. You know, I just, I, I had a plan. I wanted to do a McTwist, and I wanted to do a McTwist 7. Um, I did the McTwist and it was felt awesome. And I wanted to just sit on that. And then JP comes through and switch McTwists it. Um, almost just as high. Right? Really? Yeah. That's a kick in the ball sack. <laughs> yeah. And so what are friends for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, it's like, all right, well, if I want if I want to use my McTwist, I gotta come up with something else. So I did the McTwist seven. It happened really easy and but I still wasn't, I just wasn't happy with that. And so I was like, I think I can go nine. And I just started winging it. I put like three, three into it. And I was just kept coming around kind of back seat, uh, not really just getting over the front, front foot to get the landing. And, and then Kearns just threw that out. I was actually hiking up and, you know, in that goalie, you can kind of air the dirt. I don't know how many mm -hmm. times, you know, if you've shot it that many times, you know, that build, like you come around that corner and dropping in and you're you're hot like that's almost that's the hardest part of the whole thing yeah and we had i believe we had a bit of a dirt gap in it that year and and so you'd kind of rip the berm and do this little dirt step down that was you know it was only five feet but it was a thing to navigate and kern's just i was right at that dirt patch hiking up and kern's just like i think you should take your shirt off <laughs> and i was just i just kind of laughed at him you know and then then the whole crew got behind it and they're just like, yeah, dude, take the shirt off. You know, you'll do it. I was like, all right. So I just took the shirt off right there and then, and then I put it down and it worked. Like that was the thing, right? Like you just put it down cause the shirt's off. And so it corrected my mistake. But that being said, I never liked my McTwist nine. It, it I, it made it in because the shirt was off. Mm. If I had my clothes on, then I would have kept doing it even after that landing because I would have want, I wanted to clean it up. I can still see even now I watch the shot and I'm irritated because I come around, you know, that last 180 and I'm just back and I have to kind of throw my arms to get my body over that front foot. And that was to me unacceptable. Like it, it at that time, like you just didn't, you just didn't while out like that. Like, keep your scene together in the air. Otherwise, you're not a pro. Like, pros keep it together. And if you're not a pro, it's totally acceptable. You can, you're can you learning, right? But when you're putting something out on display 
and you're committing to film too. I don't know. It was just a different, different process. So clothes on, I probably have kept going, done it different. And nowadays they're much looser, huh? <laughs> and you guys, you guys were setting the bar at that time. Yeah. So it's like that, you know, you kind of have to think like that when you're the one setting the bar, I feel like as well. Yeah. And it, yeah, I don't know that it was, I felt like we were setting the bar. Um, I felt like getting back to Dogger, I think he set the bar for me. He told me what is going in and what's not from that that argument we had you know and so then I knew I was just like dude like that shirtless shirtless McTwist if Kearns wasn't a part of that probably wouldn't have gone in <laughs> you know let's give him a little air horn yeah, yeah let's give him an air horn <laughs> going back to sitting down both of them <laughs> with Mac Dog and he's showing you your best friend JP's clips and he's comparing JP your ninth grade friend was that like something that maybe pushed you further because you guys grew up together and then here you are looking at JP's dope put together part and then he's like, this is what you need. Did that push you harder, him being your best friend? Absolutely. I mean, and and never never in a competitive way where it, where it was the take the dude out scene. It was just like, you know, it was always like, yo, if I want to hang with this dude, this is where I got to be. And otherwise I'm just going to fade out you know, and so level up and then get the people leveling up underneath you because then you start to solidify what your stat is, right? Like JP did that simple pleasures year one, like FT, he just came out and just laid it down. And so that was the example, you know, and, and, you know, put up or shut up. Crazy you guys say. came from the same school like that. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's perfect. And that actually brings us to the guest question. Now, the guest question is presented by Solomon Snowboards. If you're looking to get yourself a nice price point snowboard, get yourself a Solomon Sleepwalker. That's what the kid Tommy Gesme rides. And, uh, yeah, highly recommend it. But that brings us to the guest question. And this one is from none other than the man we're talking about, J.P. Walker. What, really? Jeremy Jones, it's your boy oh. JP, calling you from Canada, homie. I escaped the USA for a little bit, so I got to phone this one in, but I had a question for you. We were filming for The Resistance, I believe, and got a call from Kurt Heine. He had some stuff set up at Timberline and wanted us to fly up, but we didn't think the weather was going to play, so we weren't really feeling the vibe, but he insisted, so we reluctantly boarded a flight up to PDX. And when we landed, grabbed our bags, walked outside the terminal, took one look at the sky, saw clouds. And what do we do next? Let them know. Love you, brother. <laughs> little tearjerker hearing his voice. That's yeah. my boy. Um, yeah, no, that's funny. I'm glad he brought that up. Yeah, we uh, yeah, landed in PDX and... We just look out and, you know, it was a suspect shoot anyway. It was kind of like a stretch to, you know, some Ross Steffi hood thing, which is always could be good, you know. Ross Steffi, love you, dude. You man, that dude came up with some stuff. So he had whatever set up. Richards was up there and we called Richards and we're like, what's the scene? And he confirmed that our our suspicions were correct. And so we landed in PDX, went down, got our bags, went right back up the escalator, booked a ticket and flew home. <laughs> Just like <laughs> that was that classic. That's so cool. And then we, we, you know, rough's like, what do you <laughs> like? He, <laughs> psych. psych. We're in PDX. Psych. <laughs> rough. Our team manager, Steve rough at the time was, you know, he's like, where are you guys? Why aren't you there? And, we're back in Salt Lake now and we're like, who's calling him? You calling him? I'm calling <laughs> who's calling him? Who's gonna deal with this? And you know, we're just like, yo, dude, it just wasn't the call, dude. We had to bounce. <laughs> so yeah, that was that. It was but that was a you know, that was like I mean, that's a move, dude. That's like that's a pro move right there. That's a four and eight move, is what that yeah, is. That's, that's a four and eight pro move. move. <laughs> yeah. When you're on that level, it's it was like, dude. You know, we knew where we were sitting too. Like, had we been sitting on a quarter of a part, then we're up there in that weather, no yeah, question. Yeah, you shots. But we're looking at, you know, we are both comfortably staring down a part. I'm sure, or we wouldn't have made that move. So, 
That's a fucking power move. Yeah. I'm not going to argue that. That's a that's some respect. I've never heard of anyone doing that, like going and grabbing their bags, booking another ticket, getting out. Yeah, <laughs> I no, love it. I, love I haven't heard like it that. much either. We share that story and people trip, but man, that yeah, I'll admit that was pretty bossy. We oh, kind of own that bossy. one. Bossy. We were talking to Seth, getting some intel uh, about about yourself, and he was saying some stuff about you guys would play dice. And mm. there'd be a lot of money getting thrown around. Yeah. You yeah. Got any, you got any biscuits, any fiscal biscuit amounts? Oh yeah. I mean, if you want, I mean, we'll, we'll just throw Travis Woods name in here. I was going to say, I was, I was best friends with him and I was involved in some of those games. Yeah. Let's, let's bring Big him money. in now and let's give maybe, let's maybe give Travis he, an air horn here he because. He might actually be here next week. And really? Be, yeah. If he shows up, hopefully we'll get him in that seat and hear his perspective on the dice. Oh, games. that'd be, that'd be sweet. But he's, you know. And and shouts to him on the on the uh, forum stuff because he was he was a king like he sat in the office and he you know he went through the photos and and he took you know binders of Jeremy photos JP photos Yoni photos to the magazines and so they're just like what do you guys want you want a Yoni interview here you go take your thirteen photos that you want and your six sequences what are, it's all here. You know, and he, he just made it easy for the mags to bite into the forum eight, right? And obviously they wanted it. Um, and we're paying them. Everyone's paying the mag like forum and four stars paying the mags from, you know, blend, four square, forum, circa, all over the place. Like they were, you know, raking it in off that. And what was the question? CeeLo. How much Cee-Lo. biscuits? <laughs> How, we're talking we need to know numbers here. There we go. Okay. So let's get into, let's just go in straight numbers. So we started doing CeeLo, rolling dice, um, and it was $1 bets. Had to be, cash had to be there, right? Or you don't play. Yeah. That quickly was gone. And I think it was Bjorn that probably started doing the, the kind of ghost money. Like, let's just pretend we have it. And so, and then all of a sudden, dude, we're in the corner of some Europe um, after party playing CeeLo and you know I'm not drinking I'm not partying I'm just trying to kill time really and so that's what we end up doing and dude we lost so much money like I wrote I think I was up to 17 grand (laughs) in (laughs) CeeLo fake 17 grand (laughs) yeah I still laugh at myself (laughs) for it and and then or maybe so you guys were taking notes on money. You didn't actually have well, we, the money. It you was just like, up okay, here. And Travis is yeah. just like laughing. Travis He's like, writing. I know exactly what well, you owe me. Because he was usually winning. Yeah, he won. He won. So he he racked me up. I think seventeen. He racked uh, BJ up around twenty one or twenty three <laughs> grand thousand dollars yeah. dude you don't mess with wood and money so this yeah. is this is a lot like the scene in dumb and dumber when he shows up with a briefcase full of ious yeah yeah and he's like that's a lamborghini and travis yeah. never missed a so, beat on so who continue. owed what oh, Sorry no. to interrupt. so we get back to to san clemente and and next thing i know i get in this i mean essentially an invoice <laughs> yeah, send me from a check, travis brother. <laughs> and he's like i'll cut you a break i'll you only have to pay me 12 grand thanks travis <laughs> So he kept me a 5K break. I do thank him for that. <laughs> and uh, so I did. I wrote a check for $12,000 from Zion's Bank. I should pull that up. That'd be a fun one to find again. Yeah. And uh, I wrote him a check for $12,000, $12, and then I, I never gambled again. That was it. That was my, that was my experience with gambling, and, and I think he knocked BJ's down to my total. So he knocked BJ's down to like 17 or 14 or something like that. But BJ paid him as well. And so, yeah, we paid out. And we were making money, but, man, not that much money. Not enough money to, like, write a $11,000, $12,000 check. For a friendly dice game. <laughs> yeah, not so friendly. <laughs> not so friendly because uh, it's like code of the streets. You got to pay. Yeah, you got to pay. You got to pay. For sure. <laughs> okay, this brings us to a fan... Favorite section of the show. Jeremy, you know what section that is? Name that video part. That is absolutely correct. (laughs) So name that video part is presented by the Dew Tour. It's one of the most progressive events out there. Uh, They got modified half pipe. They got a great slope style event. 
And hopefully you guys get a chance to check it out. I love hearing this. This is so good being here. Hollowed ground, you guys. Truly. I don't know what that means. That means like they say that about churches and I just feel very I know who sat in this chair. And like I can feel it. That's some heat, dude. So nice work, you guys. I really, Glad to be here. Really appreciate it. I also want to make a side note about these chairs. These are actually my <laughs> these are actually my chairs that have been sitting outside in the winter for about <laughs> six years. They're not bad, dude. And um, they're comfy. They've got they're weathered. Um and we the budget's it's still not flowing like the Nile. We're keeping the chairs. So how are you feeling as far as uh, confidence level, one through ten, about this? Oh, uh, zero to one. Really? Yeah. So point five. We'll we'll put a number at point Give five. Give him a point five. Yeah. Okay. Point five. Okay. Here we go. Really? <laughs> I'm for sure gonna say it wrong, aren't I? Um. So that's JP. Yes, that's correct. But I could have easily said that wrong. Just because it like it again, it all blends, dude. It like blends. I know JP's part because I sat through the edit, the whole thing, and then, uh, dude, you guys hooked me up on that though. That was a meatball. Chris is pretty meatball. nice about what we this have, thing because it's a participation it, award. It is. <laughs> I just want to give you this cooler. We got an igloo cooler filled with bomb hole merch, dude. Thank you. He all, makes it a little bit harder on the viewers, I think. You know, this morning it just you know what I just thought the JP part was the part. Yeah. yeah, that's a classic one. We should put that one in the show notes too. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's the resistance that part up. Yep. He's driving around the Mercedes with the. He's got like the chain and um, all the stuff. gold fronts. He still yeah. has them, and yeah, dude. Does that he was, still have those fronts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I liked when he used this. Is how we do it. Yeah, that that's, was such that's a shake good down. one. Yeah, Man. shake down the front board through the key. What a was, song to use for a video part. <laughs> no, he he was always good at picking songs. Man, he, he was. He put some good ones in. Thanks for this. This is. I've been chomping for one of these. I I wanted to offer money for one and ha. to get one before, but then I thought I'd take my shot at this, and I thought for sure I'd get it wrong. But you guys hooked me up. It's well, a participation. We're stoked thing. We you got left one, you. Jeremy. You wouldn't have left empty-handed. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so for part two of name that video part, this one's for the listener viewers. Comment on the Instagram for a chance to win what, buds? Prize pack. That is absolutely mm-hmm. correct. All right. Mm. Thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. I don't know that one. Not that that's a surprise, but I think I know that one. Um, I want to transition to something I haven't heard you talk much publicly about. And I want to preface this with a story from my banker. I mm-hmm. one time was at the bank, and this guy, find, my banker, found out I was a snowboarder. And he said, oh, do you know Jeremy Jones? I said, yes pulls up this video and he's like, it's you doing all this cool stuff. You know, I think you're snowboarding, riding a motorcycle around. And then, and then the punchline at the end comes up and says, I'm Jeremy Jones and I'm a Mormon. And I had no fucking idea that, you know, what your faith was or anything like that. But you've never really spoken publicly about it. And I wanted to see if you wanted to, you know, touch on that and, and where you're at with it and what kind of role it plays in your life. Yeah. I mean, I'm a Mormon. I grew up with a Mormon family. Uh, my, I had mentioned my parents split up. That was my out of going to church. You know, I went to church. My parents drug me to church till you know, I was 10. And then they split up. And then it was like I woke up Sunday morning and no one was hollering at me, you know, to get my clothes on, get dressed, and get out the door and, and get to church in time. And, and so that was it. I just, I stopped. But, and I didn't revisit it until my early 20s. My wife, meeting my wife, kind of put it back in play for me. I always grew up around Mitch, Brandon, Mitch Nelson, Brandon Bybee. You know, half of our Farmington crew was uh, Mormon kids. So I knew about it, and, you know, we we already kind of acted that, that role, um, whether we were Mormon or not. You know, we just, we were about skating and snowboarding, and that was kind of it, truly. So nothing else even really distracted us. Uh, outside of that. So I kind of got back into it, dove really heavy into it. And that was in those forum days. And that's um, my part. Uh, what part the is it where I'm sitting there? With the resistance. The, is that the resistance yeah, with the, the suit on? Mm-hmm. That was the whole thing with that was I took so much heat from standing by that, you know, and, and one of the moves was that I just wouldn't film on Sundays. Like I took a step back and said, I'm going to chill 
this is going to be a day that I just chill. I don't, I don't put out like I normally put out. Right. And that was for a lot of reasons. Um, they, they teach that in, in the Mormon religion, like you, the Sabbath day, you, you chill out, you operate differently. You notice that it's a, a day you pay attention to differently. Right. And so I liked that. I thought that concept was great. Um, was not that rad for filming. Uh, weekends are important for filming, things being closed. And so it it caused a lot of waves. You know, there was a lot of people not that stoked on me. And I'd be in Minnesota and Sunday would roll around and I'd just kick it, you know. And then, so I ran that for a few years and it was rough, dude. Like, that's what that intro is. It was just like everyone around me is going crazy, partying, doing their thing. And I'm just sitting there kind of like, all right, when can we, when can we board? When can we do some filming? You know, that's what we want to do. And it was rough, dude, but it, it taught me a lot. It taught me to stand for something. Um, and I kept going with that for quite a few years. Uh, eventually started filming Sundays again, which I still would do, um, you know, I operate different on Sundays now, but I can also operate different on any day. And so I've, I've started to apply that to, to my life. So if I just want to operate differently a day a week or as often as possible, so I can just acknowledge, you know, what, what, what I am, like, what am I doing here? What am I, what am I working on? What am I looking at? Where's my mindset? Like, it's just kind of a self check in, you know, a bit of meditation to some degree in that in there as well. And you know, Mormonism is is crazy. It's like it's crazy, dude. You know, like the basis of it is certainly I like it. I like the morals it teaches. Um, I like that it teaches love, uh, family, friends, and compassion, empathy. And those are the things that I take from it. Those are the things that I practice. Um, I ask a lot of questions. That's kind of what's led me to where I'm at with it now. And, you know, it's ultimately kind of steered me away in, in terms of, you know, almost, almost struggling even calling myself a Mormon sometimes because I, I feel very, like, at a base level for sure. But you start asking me about Joseph Smith and, and you know the book of mormon and these actually like added scriptures and and i start to have too many questions and i see too many holes and i see things that i can't that i can't answer and i don't know that it's for me to answer whether it's true or not right but i do know that the base of it all is our true principles and and they're what i what i said like i i've proven time and time again that when i love it it gives back always and, and when I love, all my selfishness goes away. And so when I give that, I get more. And it, it, it almost starts to feel selfish because I'm like, oh, I, I just, you know, I don't know, thinking about my wife, that was something we learned. And I just, I was one day, just like, you know what? She's first in everything. Everything I do is cross-checking it with her. And when I started doing that, dude, I, I was skating more. I was snowboarding more. I was, she was more comfortable. I was more comfortable. We, we became, we worked better together, you know? And so that's a principle that anyone can get. Anyone knows love, you know, you feel it, learn to apply it. Uh, you don't need religion necessarily to teach you that, but it's, it's a heavy focus in Mormonism and family. And like I mentioned before, I've always wanted a baby girl, you know, and I, I wanted a family and so I have a, a son and a daughter and and that's like to me that's that's what religion is to me it's my family and so that's where I'm at with it now uh yeah it's a it's a it's a tricky one you know and that that video though is probably one of the most seen videos that you're, I have you're out talking there. about the one that my banker the, your banker yeah. video yeah. this I'm a Mormon video and it's hardly any snowboarding in it. I think it's like me at Brighton putting around. What I kind of even, views are we talking? I 
I don't know, like 350,000 maybe, something like that. I just learned that from a friend. I haven't even clicked on that thing. He was just telling me the other day, 10 million. And I was like, dude, you're tripping. Yeah, 10 million. I'm all, there's no, nothing has that. And then he's like, ah, I was a little bit off. I think it's like 350 because he went and Googled (laughs) it or something. But, (laughs) but you know, the, and I just always, you know, my thing was, look, when I didn't go on a mission, I didn't go on a Mormon mission. I stayed here. I had friends that went. Um, I saw how it changed their careers. I wasn't even there at that phase anyway. At, at 18, 19, you, you kind of make that decision. You're going to go on a Mormon mission. And I wasn't really where I was at then. Um, but I, I visited it. You know, I looked at what that would look like. And I just decided that I was like, no, I can I can make an impact by by just being me standing by me and and being me you know and and we'll see what that does I think I can touch people and then I had that that video you know as a good reference of that and you know, I have missionaries come up to me and return missionaries and it's like dude that was that was the only way I could get in talk to these people is I'd I'd show them that video you know and then your banker you know he made that connection with you and I have story after story of that edit and and that's been a confirmation for me of that early on thought of just like you know this this is my role my role is to is to try to make a positive impact somewhere in in people's lives and and I feel like the videos I've tried to do that you know not just that one but in the snowboarding as well like just just believe in it give it all you got and and put out a quality product and and people will feel it. They'll know. They'll know that it's the real deal. Well, that's, yeah, that's really interesting to hear that take. It's it's kind of funny navigating this topic because, like, you know, the minute religion, God, anything comes up, a lot of people, I, I'm maybe assuming, but I think a lot of listeners and stuff, they just, they fucking bolt. They're like, dude, I got to mm-hmm. get out of here. And yeah. that was beautiful the way you just navigated that. And it wasn't, it didn't feel weird. But a lot of people, they're like, especially from Massachusetts, you know, they don't know, they think a Mormon has like seven wives, right? So like for a lot of people don't know, it's like you guys, you guys don't drink, you don't, you, you know, you don't drink alcohol, you don't smoke weed, you don't get fucked up. And on Sundays you go to church most of the day. But what I wanted to unpack and get into was the fact that since you don't drink and since you don't get fucked up in snowboarding, that kind of makes you an outcast because so much of it is based around, you know, partying and going to the bar after. It's kind of like a recreational fucking alcoholic degenerate sport. So did you feel like, you know, any of your relationships with your brands or companies you rode for suffered because you kind of followed those guidelines and didn't drink? Oh, for sure. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, we'd always joke and it's not a joke, but contracts were signed at the bar and that was always, or at the party, right? That's, that's where the deals were made. And that's where, you know, people would walk away with killer deals and, and I wasn't getting them. I truly wasn't. Like I would, I would, you know, the part of the reason I left Forum in the end there was, there was just too many promises that were laid out in front of me. Literally, check boxes. You hit these, check these boxes, then you get this. You get this. You know, pro boot, X amount of royalties. Check this box, and then you'll get your phantom stocks, which were exactly that, phantom stocks in the end. So even those that got those got nothing, but all of these boxes I started checking, um, they weren't, I wasn't getting, uh, you know, what I was promised. And now that's ultimately why I ended up leaving. It just was, I could just see the road ending there. Like I wasn't, I wasn't part of, of that part of it. And, and it hindered them. It hindered their, their party scene. You know, it was something that, it looked weird when they'd roll in with Forum 7, you know, or Forum 6 if JP decided to stick with me. And, I mean, JP played the role. He'd run in there and he'd do the thing. And, you know, he he didn't, he didn't wasn't a big partier, but he'd, he'd run the races, you know. And I just wasn't that comfortable with that. It was never my – I never did it. I didn't go to high school parties often. I didn't – I wasn't, like, chasing girls um, – I just let those things happen as they happened. I was just so focused on, you know, skating and snowboarding. It's, it's sounds so kid and Daryl. Right. But it, it, that's all I could think about, dude. It's all I wanted to do. 
I think a lot of people think that when you're not drinking, you judge them. It's their own insecurities. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, if you have a partying team manager and you're not partying or whatever, friend, family member, they they feel like you, you think you're moral, morally superior or some shit. And they're like, why aren't you drinking? Why aren't you drinking? It makes them uncomfortable. So I could see how that would affect those yeah. relationships with those people. And and did that, not to put words in your mouth, did that kind of uh, kind of expedite the move to Burton? Do you want to kind of explain that transition? Yeah. I, it just became real, you know. And, and I unpacked it the same way you just explained it. You know, I understood that it was... It's a perception, you know, it's, it's how people are taking on what it is that you're putting out, you know, and that could be negative, even though you didn't express it in that way. But just like, just by not showing up looks a certain way. If you don't have the context to explain why you didn't show up or the platform, I should say, why you didn't show up, like I didn't show up because of this. And if you could have those conversations, which you can't and you don't, it's just like, are you in or you out? I'm in. I'm out. Okay. See ya. Why is he always out? You know, no one really wanted to ask. And then once the question came, it was like, how do you, how do you break that down into something simple and one word? It's like, dude, there's so many reasons why, but honestly, it's because I just want to wake up and skateboard tomorrow and like be able to do that. That's the simplest answer, right? It's not religion. It's not that I don't want to party. It's not that I don't want to hang out with those friends and, and watch them. And because and, it's hilarious, dude. Like, I mean, you know, like, it's so fun being at parties and watching people just get buck. Like, dude, it's entertainment. It's fun. And when they're, you know, when they're wasted out of their mind, it's almost even more fun. And so it, it was never that. But sometimes you don't want to be around it. You don't want to be spit on. You don't want to watch people throw up. You don't want to be a part of that part of it, right? And and really, that's that's it. But yeah, it just it sped things up because it just defined that it was time, you know. And then and then Downing kind of reached out to me and JP, and we kind of had that Burton meeting, and that was that's all she wrote. Yeah, that's beautiful. I want to circle back on one thing too, though. I can touch on was getting fucked up. There also inversely is a camaraderie built between when you go out with a heavy night of drinking with a team and everybody does come closer. And if you're, I could also see, you know, looking at play devil's advocate, looking at it from the other side, if everybody's out there getting fucked up, there's a camaraderie getting built. You're not a part of it. That's a different kind of, you know, just to kind of, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I saw it. And I was like, look, I get it. I get it. This is, you know, and it, at first it was personal because I was doing the thing. That was the personal part. Like I checked that box. I came through with that video part that you told me to for that boot. I didn't get the boot. I came through with the next video part for those phantom stocks. I didn't get those phantom stocks. Came through with the next video part. I didn't get that raise. You know, it's like when those things happen and then you got to start looking at it like, okay, what what's going on and then it just all of it pointed to this and so how do how do we navigate that and where's is there a better home is there somewhere that you can do what I'm doing and not have this sort of side effect you know which was that it was you know a team being a team and unless the team understands everyone on the team and is part of it then it becomes a whole you know if the one person's not there Mm -hmm. Burton was just a little more professional, I guess. Huh? Yeah, and spread out. Yeah. You know, there was, like, I I got on Burton, and I was still able to do my thing. And that was the stipulation. I want to do my thing with Mac Dog. I'm not going to come into all of your Burton movies and do that. Like, going into it was, I was still riding with all the forum guys. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, because yeah. that first year was Shakedown. Shakedown. Now, going into the Shakedown, for the listeners and viewers that don't know, you had last part, which is the unofficially the best part in the movie <laughs> by all video standards. And you did the 450, you did all that crazy stuff. It seemed like you were just fucking on a mission that year. What was your mentality going into that? It was that. It was just like, you know what? All these people can just eat a dick. 
you know, and I'll show you. Like, I'll give you the dick to eat. Spiteboarding. That's yeah. spiteboarding. Spiteboarding. Oh, we love spiteboarding here at the bomb hole. <laughs> and that, I mean, it was heavily influenced on that, you know, and I was still, I was just running high on on a new deal with Burton, and it felt right. Um, I was working on some boards with them. Uh, I was still riding with JP. We just brought Seth into into the crew. Um, Cooley was on the crew that year, and uh, it was go time. You know, everyone was all in, and that that shakedown crew was forum eight in a sense. You know, like the crew was so down for the movie, all of them, and the Canadians were. Um, everyone just put in, and and that was that was a magical year. You know, it was. So much stuff went down. That was heavy. So JP smashed his jaw as well. Yeah, smashed this is his, how we do it. Part. Yeah, jaw on, on perfect jump and and life lighted him out and that was wild and you know learning those experiences in the back country and how to deal with that and yeah, it was intense and yeah, that was crazy and you know that's probably why I ended up with the last part because he broke his face. <laughs> you know, J. I mean, there's no question, JP as is the better snowboarder when you're talking of a JP Jeremy duo. Like he was, he's magical on that thing. Like he can pull things off that it just doesn't work for other people, you know? And, and he had that, he had the, the natural talent. It was just given to him, but that does not take away any effort when I say that, because that dude would just think things through. You know, he had a mental process that was excruciating. And and no one knows it. You know, they just look at him like, oh, dude, dude just does it first try. It's like, well, yeah, but the six months leading up to that first try was like nightmares every night, you know? And how do I get there? How do I do this? How do I, how do I do it first try? You know, and so he just worked on it from that angle and, and I just was like, all right, let's just go. First try. All right, that hurt. How do we not make it hurt as much? You know, and then 300 tries later, you get the thing. So we just had that dynamic. And yeah, it, yeah, it was intense, man. Good year. That was a good year. Hell of a good year. I love that video. And going back to signing that Burton deal, I know it's in the past now. Can we... Can we get some biscuit talk going? Can we can we talk biscuits? Is this off the record or are we? No, I mean that was you know that one wasn't even that sweet. Well, I shouldn't say that because I'd take that now for sure. But it was, you know, we worked up to some bigger biscuits, but I think I came out on that one. I think I signed that deal like a hundred and fifty k maybe a year annually mm-hmm, a year, and that's head to toe. That was almost head to toe. I was saving. I didn't do goggles yet. Um, I was still trying to part things out. I didn't want to dive all in. Diversify your bonds, in the words of yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So I ran that for the first three years, the first contract season, and then the second one. They just really wanted to pull me in, and they kind of put me to AK and and specified it a little more, and then yeah, and then got got some bumps and. In some are we disc. gonna? Are we gonna get any? Uh, are we gonna discuss numbers? the top? Uh, gonna, top of the line. You want just top years? <laughs> like top years. Yeah, straight up. Top year fiscal. Top fiscal years. Earnings. So top year for like four, five years. You know, with dude, there was so much money to make, like, but like the stuff I could depend on. I was just shy of half a mil for probably like four, three or four years. Wow. That's what we're talking about. And that's Woo. that's before taxes. Yes. So you that's get a, hit with that. That's a heavy check and to the IRS. Also, this is what's fucked up is why I don't think I could ever be Mormon. Then you got to give 10% to the church. Yeah. And so Tax. that video you're you, talking about, you asked me the other day, you're all, yes. did you get paid for that Mormon video? I said, no, I paid for that Mormon video. That's part of the deal, huh? <laughs> like that 10% I've been paying... That's what paid. I that, paid for that video. That yeah. half a Milski dips down real quick with that taxes. That was my sponsor and money. I, IRS. <laughs> Yo, will you guys do one with me? <laughs> I've been paying. <laughs> IRS and the 10%, that definitely is a healthy check to watch disappear, I guess. Yeah, but, you know, it's it's mindset, right? So, you know you know stuff going into it. So, it's it's my mom always told me if you're, ma- if you're paying money, 
to the IRS specifically. She's like, if you're paying money, it means you're making money. Yeah, so exactly. I always just took that mindset, and yeah, that bisque was dope. And There's no way to get away from it. The no. IRS is collecting. But dude, that was like, we could make so much money on photo incentives too, you know. And for the first few years, had no cap, and I did. I wasn't that good at. It. I never did. I was all inclusive with forum. I didn't. I wasn't getting photo incentives. Um, and so when Burton came with photo incentives, I didn't know how that ran totally. Blotto taught me that. Thank you, Blotto. Sat, yeah. sat down and broke it all down for you. Dude, respect to Blotto. No cap. Dude. No cap. And Rappers say that a lot. No yeah, way. for a while. And, and you know, he's like, dude, you're missing out on so much money. Oh, because you wouldn't even submit it. I wouldn't even submit it. Because you knew it was in your contract, but you were just like, eh, I don't yeah, even know just, what's up with this. Yeah, it was just too much work, and my, you know, my paycheck was good. Yeah. Like, I wasn't fighting for money which I'd done my whole life. And so I was like, oh, I'm chilling, dude. Yeah. I don't need anything extra. And then you start to, he's like, dude, really? He's like, look at this. Yeah. And then I, I would get like an envelope from Blotto and it'd be like 10 spreads. And he's all just do the math real quick. Yeah. You know, and he just kind of give me that nudge and I do the math on these 10 spreads and I'm like, Oh, this is like 15 grand. And then that was Blotto picking out the photos and he from used like to do Japan that for a lot of guys and, too yeah what a, what a guy i mean i st i'll still get a, a envelope from blotto of pages of magazines international mags yeah, yeah he like pulls them yeah. out and sends them in case you didn't see this yeah. no I way don't, yeah. i don't i don't think you would have seen this yeah. but i just wanted you to know here you go and it's like the cover of the mag if you're on the cover it's you and then whatever's inside or it's the cover of the mag and then your shot. Yeah. You know, so you know what it is. And it could be some little mag in Spain that you would never see. And Blotto's dude, like, dude, check this out. So sick. And yeah, one year I made 90 grand, dude, on photo incentive. What? That's a good <laughs> yeah, year, dude. That's a good year. And then they started capping us. We moved into, you know, 30 grand caps eventually towards the end. And I don't that. even know if it so, exists anymore. That still helps with that 10% too. Oh, dude. You know, yeah. yeah I mean, and you just put it to that. Like if you wanted to, you'd just be like, all right, well, that's what I, that's what that money is, you know? And that was all my, my photo incentive turned into, once I learned this, that was my tax. Yeah. Money. You're like, all right, sweet. So I, I would just, you know, do what I did. And then I would submit once a year just before taxes. And I'd get all that money, and then I'd pay my taxes. And that was kind of my my routine for a handful of years. Dude, I'm loving. That's some good years, man. Good yeah. for you. Yeah, thanks. Well earned, though, man. You guys worked hard. Mm -hmm. When you look at that era specifically, you know, you had J.P. Walker over there, and he's kind of pushing his first double cork, uh, first all a lot of first rail tricks, like technical rail tricks, I'd say. And then you kind of, once you got on Burton, started pushing a different direction, like, Probably the first wall ride, I'm guessing, or one of the first kind of, and then you did that that street loop. And uh, what was the mentality, or or how did you come up with your thought process on the direction you took your your street tricks, stuff like that? Oh, that just always came from year before. I mean, it was just a direct comparison to the year. Like, what did I do? Um, what do I need to do to kind of up my game? personally like how can I how can I feel like I can do this again this year like create another video part you know and it was just that it was just it wasn't to do something that had never been well it kind of was actually to do I mean I had a lot of things in my head that just hadn't ever been done and so those became you know high level tricks and so you'd you'd stack up whatever you could until that chance came and then you would hit it, you know, like the back two on Mueller was, it's really my only never been done, I would say. I mean, the wall rides was debatable. Me and Mark Frank had some back and forths on who did that first and who, you know, because we did it the same year. We were both poking at that. And I think even a couple other people heard about it and poked at it that same season. And so it's really hard to claim that stuff. But the back two for me personally at Mueller was you know, I still have that board, the board broke and I just wrote on it and I wrote, you know, back to Mueller break. And that break is what locked me in that, that move, you know, and it, and it brought me off the end of the rail perfect. And I wasn't still spinning like so many people do them, you know, even still, it was just, it was like the perfect one. And 
that's still one of my favorite tricks that I've ever done just because I can, I can still feel the board just crack. And then I just felt it like lock me in on that square rail because it broke just on the, on the inside and it just like locked dude. And that was, that felt so good. And yeah, you know, and, and same thing with JP, like his double cork that just came dude, because we would just do corks and he, we'd always over rotate him. And he's like, what if you just stay tucked? And I'm like, well, then you're doing a double. <laughs> and he's like, I think this is the jump. And that's how that happened. It wasn't, wasn't this big process. That one, he normally had things pretty thought out, but he had, he had been thinking about what that over rotation felt like for so long of us learning these other tricks. And then he just applied that. And that's how the double cork happened, you know? And so it wasn't, you know, there's this idea that you want to, you want to step up, you want to do stuff that's never been done. That's hard to do though. You know, it's hard to just set that, that goal because it becomes one trick. It becomes so one, one sided. And then you forget to fill in the rest of the stuff. And so, yeah, you know, it's just a balance of building the video part and getting that part done and also stepping up your game and then leveling up snowboarding, you know, the best you can, because that's what people are looking at you to do at that time, you know, was they would wait for those videos to come out and you would watch them. And if it was the same video you saw the year before, then that's a miss. Yeah. How do you, how do you evolve? How do you get better? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's cool. And also uh, around this time, one thing that I thought was cool is you guys kind of, you know, you specifically, I won't say you guys, you seem to start almost mentoring some people. Like you took Alex Andrews under your, your wing and started showing people the ropes. I don't know if that's something that happens nowadays. Maybe it does, but do you want to kind of talk about the reasons why you did that and that whole process? Yeah. Like at Burton, especially I, I wanted some rail kids on my squad. You know, that was a huge part of it. Like it was, that's where Alex came in. Um, and, and just show people how to do it. You know, like we went through so many hacks and, and tries that there's just so much stuff that you don't have to go through if you don't have to go through it. And so if, if they're coming up on your team, if they're coming up on your film crew, their part's going to make your part stand out. And so you have to have that look at it. And if it becomes, my part only, then you're not a team player and that it you offset the dynamic of that crew and it doesn't work. And so, and that happens, it happened, you know, still. And that, that was just a big focus for me. And so anytime, you know, I had Alex came online, I was just, it was just put to me like, Hey, do you have, who should we bring on? And I just started doing some sniffing. I think, uh, Josh Fisher, he was repping Burton stuff and he kind of linked me to Alex. He'd, he'd been doing some rep deal with him and checked out some of Alex's footage. And, and I was like, Oh, he's, he's creative. Like he's doing, doing some stuff that it's kind of up my alley, you know, in terms of just how he thinks about tricks and, you know, and then, then from there it was Ethan and Zach. Those were my boys. And, and I loved it. I loved showing him. I used to always tell him, you know, you, you, you can be in it for five or you can be in it for 15. It's your choice. You know, it's not, it is your choice. And then, so when they would like unpack tricks and try to figure out, should I do this? You think this is good for my part? You think this is, and I'm like, well, you tell me five or 15. Like that was always my thing. I'd throw it back at them, you know, good five advice. or 15. Yeah. And then, and then they would just, however they worked through that. I don't know. I don't know how much it stuck with either one of them, but I always brought it up and I always asked that question and then they would work through it. And then, you know, they would bring the 15 Zach, especially like and you're saying 15 year, 15 career year career, or five, five year, year career. career. That's yeah. awesome. And Zach, Zach brought the 15. Like he's, he's like, okay, I'm, that's where I'm at. You know, Ethan, probably more on the five. He's lasted longer than that, but yeah. he's like, <laughs> you know, talent all day long but he's just a different different lifestyle you yeah. know wisconsin kid he just he he lives a good life you know and he likes the way he runs his program and so he won't be a 15 probably and that's not a bad thing necessarily no but. well it's cool to hear your perspective on that too and like 
you can see somebody like Hale took your advice and probably your work ethic rubbed off on him. And one thing people don't realize with experience with older, older guys is that in snowboarding, there's a lot of trial and error. You have to build a backcountry jump or you have to build, uh, you know, let's say, you know, know how much speed you need to get for a rail or this or that. So like taking, take a backcountry jump, for example, you know, you take a 16 year old kid, you build a cheese wedge. They might not put the right amount of like, you know, steepness on the kicker. They might mm-hmm. not know where to start. Whereas like I've been in the backcountry with take Mikey rents or something like that. And he's just like, you know, start here. This is where you start. And you know, you, mm-hmm. you go, you hit the landing. Perfect. So yeah. there is, there is kind of a, you can't really substitute experience in a lot of these circumstances. No. And, and you know, I'll, I'll say it right now to all you young boarders out there that are trying to get it, like, listen to that because they're right. Like if Mikey tells you that this is the speed, there's no one else to trust. I promise. Like it's him in that situation. And and same with me in the street. If I'm telling you that this is the speed, the reason I'm saying it is because it is. Otherwise, I'm not going to say it. You know, I'll say I don't know otherwise. And, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm so proud of Zach, dude. Like, I, I get so stoked, you know, seeing him put out and then that, I don't even know. Was it trash? Is that what that yeah, last his, part? His movie, dude. That was messed up, yeah. dude. Like, yeah. Thank you. Like, <laughs> it was so good, dude. It was so good, and and I like to think, you know, I feel good maybe because I just kind of see part of my influence in that, and I see him grind. I see him grind in Europe. I see him like, you know, step out of whatever it is he his normal would be, and and make those leaps and he pulls it off. You know, he pulled that part off like with nothing kind of, and that's impressive to me. So you had some pretty incredible years over at Burton. And then from what I understand, it was kind of an abrupt rug swiped up from under you ending. Correct. Yeah. Like a little didn't bit see it coming. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, let's like expecting it to come for sure. Like you, I mean, it was kind of like that every contract, right? It was just like, all right, am I the old dude that's getting tossed, you know? But it, but I wasn't. Um, I even had Knox rework. You know, we had we had started talking some deals. It was all in the works. Um, I had reworked another three year deal with Knox. It had actually been approved, and. I had worked out after those three years, I was going to roll into kind of like under downing essentially. And I'd, I'd had these discussions with internally with people in the office that would then, you know, ultimately be my boss, I guess. And that was the deal. Like, okay, we'll, we'll revisit this in three years. We like what this lane looks like. I mean, there was, it was a long-term plan, you know, and yeah. And then I got a call, uh, from Knox and Karen. Let's give Karen an air horn, please. Karen Yankowski. She is Burton team. I mean, they call her Burton team mom, but she's, she's under the radar. That lady, I mean, everyone that's listening that knows anything about Burton and her will be so happy I'm saying this. I know it because she's just, she's just that woman, you know, She's, how old is she, 55 something? Sorry, Karen, if you're younger than that. But she's just, she cares about her kids, you know? She makes sure the contracts are clean. She's, she was very supportive of, you know, super poorly done expense reports, you know? And she would help, help teach you how to do it and, and teach you how to make the most money and teach you how to be efficient and kind of, taught us how to grow up and so thank you thank you karen Let's for give that. Another air horn. two air horns so still have that relationship with karen um so there's nothing negative there mm-hmm. but her and knox and i still have a great relationship with knox as well they both called me i was driving up 114th heading home um from the gym actually and yeah right at 7th east I make a left, I'll hit Sandy Skate Park in a few blocks. And I was just driving through it. And, yeah, Knox was just like, 
we're not going to resign you. And I was just like, all right, really? <laughs> He's just like, yeah, nothing. You know, he, and I got to give them both credit because they, they could have pushed the blame so easy because it wasn't them, you know, and they didn't, they took it, they took it on the chin. Uh, and so respect to that, but yeah, it was, it was a raw deal, man. It was, I was just had different expectations. And then when you're, you're staring down November with no board sponsor, that's the worst time, dude. You know, like there's nothing coming online at the start of the season, you know, pe- people's got their deals already. And now I'm, I'm on this Japan trip to Burton rail days and I know that I'm getting clipped. It was just weird, you know, weird, weird little end there. But, but I acted pro went to rail days. Um, I wore a bolts action shirt instead of a Burton shirt. And it took a lot of crap for that, which was surprising. I didn't know why they cared. Um, but, it, you know, I put on a show. I did my thing there, hung out with the younger riders. Dylan was there. That's where I met Benny, a um, little dust box kid. And, I mean, he must have been 15 at the time, you know. I don't know how old he is now. How old is he now? 19? 16? Probably 20. <laughs> 20. 20, <laughs> 20. And, you know, it was a good event. And then came back, and, yeah, a month later, deal was up, and that was that. So it was rough, dude. It was... You know, I don't know. I don't want to blame people. I'm over that part of it. You know, I, 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 I never liked the person I believe that pulled this trigger in the first place. So to still not like him doesn't hurt me. I don't, there's not hate. I'm not like harboring that. I'm not trying to sock the dude in the face. And if I see him, I'll just, I just will not be around. Like anyone, I don't want to be around, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, a lot of brands, it's like, okay, there's a revolving door out with the old and with the new, mm-hmm. but we have a good gauge on who people are interested in with this podcast because we'll we'll put out a feeler, oh, who should we have on the podcast? Overwhelmingly, when's Jeremy Jones coming on? Mm-hmm. When's Jeremy Jones coming on? <laughs> you know, you got Scott Stevens, Jeremy Jones, Jed, Lucas you know, Magoon, Lucas Magoon mm, Lucas. Bradshaw. And, Bradshaw. But, you know, it's funny that even though these are the people that – you know, from our perspective, our people are very interested in, and and sometimes the brands, you know, they they see it differently, and and yeah, I'm I bet there's some people there thinking they made a mistake heavily, and they have yeah to thinking that way. I I would say I don't know. Yeah, I mean that like my friends there are still my friends. Mm-hmm. That's the thing, you know, and that to me is something. Um, the people that weren't my friends that were just we were doing business together. That's what that was. We were doing business and now we're not, you know, and that's really the way it's got to be looked at. Um, I kept who I wanted to keep and unloaded who I didn't, essentially. And sometimes you're forced into those situations. Sometimes you're not. Um, This one I was. And you learn you learn who's who real quick. And then you nurture the the end of that that matters. Well, I want to talk about that kick in the ball sack with this losing that a head to toe sponsor because you know a lot of times you lose your board sponsor but you still got your outerwear mm-hmm. you lose but you lost boots goggles boards b- head to toe that one fat paycheck we're talking about right so you go from a lot to a little fast mm-hmm. now now bouncing back like you know right after that happened was there is that like a hard time in your life did you struggle you know what i mean because i think a lot of people struggle when that happens yeah, I mean, that was 2014, November, and where are we at now, 2020, so six years later. Yeah, almost the same timing. Um, yeah, barely, barely pulling out of it, I'll say. And that's, you know, I'm glad I made that money, you know, that we talked about before, that bisque, like, doing doing okay things with that carried me over the last four years you know I've I've spent a lot of money on my kids school uh that's where me and my wife felt like was important and so that was a hefty tab to keep maintained um and I didn't let it go because I it was important to me in their younger years to pay for that and pay extra for that schooling because I knew they weren't going to get it otherwise and 
And I'm glad I did because now we're in this COVID year and school's the biggest mess I've ever seen. And both of my kids have this foundation of learning that this is, you know, they, they only had about half a year um, outside of their private school. And so to me, I was an investment, you know, but it, I was, it was my, mine and my wife's retirement, you know, we're just spending it away and that's how we lived. And I, and I'm self-based in that way of like, dude, all I know is snowboarding and skateboarding. Like this is, this is all I know. I, I just need another contract. How do I get another contract? And that's what I knew how to hustle. And so I just went at hustling these contracts and nothing was paying out. You know, I wasn't getting anything and, and I wasn't part of any video projects. Um, Meyer brought me in, you know, thank you, Meyer for that. And I hit that air horn. Yeah. And he, you know, he, he didn't want money from me. You know, he didn't want sponsor money from me. If, of course, if there was anyone willing to give it, then let's try and angle it that way. But he wasn't asking for it. And he put me in that video and I just kept getting hurt because my mind wasn't in the right place, dude. I was on this hustle of like, you know, keeping, I kept calling my finance guy and just saying, yo, I need more of my money. I need more of my money. I got these bills to pay. I got this trip to go on. I need more of my money, you know? And my wife, bless her heart, it's just like, all right, you sure? Like, is this, are we going to turn this ever somehow, you know? And, but she knew, she knew the last 20 years that we had. She knew my mindset. She knew how I worked. She knew how I chased things. And, and so she believed in me. She wasn't hesitant about it. She would ask the right questions to challenge me and to put me in, like put the thing in perspective for me. And that was super helpful. And yeah, at one point it was, yeah, like this is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it. You know, whether I'm requested over and over on Bommel or not, I'm not going to land those contracts. And to, and to be frank, like I'm, I'm not going to put it out like that anymore. You know, I'm 44, 44 years old. And like, all I love is filming, dude. It's all I want to do. I want to film video parts, but it's not, it's not going to be what I do anymore. I'm not going to be filming an ender, you know, for any movie. I, I do want to film a video part um, for me because I wanted to go out on a video part and I feel like I missed that. But now I, it was just, you know, it's took me three years, three and a half years to reframe what that, how that was pulling at me into something that made sense, you know, to like, you know, can I support my family? Can I still do my thing? And can I still love my friends? Can I love myself? And, and still like pull all that off. Right. And, and ultimately, I mean, the answer was no, for sure. Like, no, you like, it's not giving it to you. Like the, the industry's not giving it to you. And although they respect what you've done, um, it's, that's not how things work. It's not on, you know, it, there's this, there's this proving period. So there is this, what have you done to get here? That's looked at, you need that, that pedigree chart. You need that resume to, to amount to certain things and get certain things if you're, if you're reaching for it. But you know, it's just, I mean, look at it. 44-year-old dude, he's filmed 21 video parts in a row. Um, he just got wrapped around a tree in an avalanche. He doesn't have his sponsors anymore. He's spending his retirement money, you know, on his, just to survive his family and his own needs to try and get back in this game, in this hustle. And I just, I reframed it. And so now I'm like, okay. I want to do a working man's video part. And that's kind of what I've been the project name in my head, you know, and it's, I got a real job now. You know, I started chasing reality about almost two years ago and that, you know, I came to that like, all right, let's just get real here. Let's get something stable. And so I started doing contract work, um, with, 
under Gunny, Chris Gunnerson, uh, who was SPT for years, right? Built all do tour X game stuff. And man, bless that dude's heart, man. And I, I actually look at all the different things that he's been involved in, in my life. And maybe I'm jumping forward a little bit here, but I started breaking it down. And man, that guy, he's been, he's been right next to me on some of our heaviest stuff. Nixon Jib Fest. I mean, we changed what a rail contest looked like with that event, you know, rider judged, invite only. Um, that was a new format. No one had ever seen that. We put that in play um, at his mountain under his builds. Uh, we did MTV games, you know, at Snow Summit under his builds. Um, what else? we And, you know, where I'm at right now with, with Woodward and Powder, like that's under him. He brought me real, in on that. Real, real snow. Real, yeah. uh, real snow. That's the other one, the big one I was thinking of. You know, he he called me up on that. I was like, hey, I got this idea. I want to see if you're you're into it. Again, I remember exactly where I was when this phone call took place. Like it was one of those, you know, just like getting clipped from Burton. And I was in my room in this little nook. There's nothing in there, just the carpet. And it was a sunny day. I had the blinds open. And I'm standing in the middle of that nook talking to Gunny. And he's he's breaking down what this. Uh, and we were calling it Real Street at the time, which to me is still the best name. I think You're, so. Yeah, Real Street. <laughs> that's what's up. So Real Street, snowboard only at the time. One minute video part. Film it in four weeks. Our, our turn in date was January 1. And we got invited to that event last week of November. So one month to film this stuff. I got invited. I said I was down. First of all, he broke down. I'm like, I'm in. Like, if you do this, this sounds like the coolest thing ever. Um, yeah. And we did. And like, then we got in, did the kind of, so I think Seth touches on it. We, mm -hmm. we sort of all just collabed. And even though we were competing with each other, we, we all wanted to see each other get the money. Cause that meant we all got it, you know, and just, not in our accounts, but by feeling, you know, and by, by friendship. And uh, that, I mean, that changed the game. I just, you know, I've been, been with Gunny on so many things that changed the game. I didn't really realize it till I sort of like walked down it. you know, all those forum shoots at snow summit, all that stuff, like insane, insane stuff. And so, yeah, mad shout out to him. And he needs a damn air. He horn do, yeah. He needs a full on air. Maybe horn. let's give him a gunshot too. Yeah. Let's do that. I got like a it. Patreon question, kind of along the lines of what we're talking about from uh, Jake Radmer. Looking back at your career as a pro snowboarder, do you have any regrets? Kind of a heavy question. Yeah, no, I'm no, I don't. I don't. I'm not a regretter. First of all, that's that's the biggest thing. I think the only thing I I, I joke about this. The, my main regret, if I have one, is that I've hated on Birkenstocks for 35 <laughs> years. <laughs> because I just put them on a couple weeks ago, and dude, life changer. And it could be the two broken legs, but still, like, that changed my life. And I'm, I'm like, dude, if I'd been walking around in these for 35 years, you'd been way more comfortable. Yeah, like this, <laughs> it might have kept you on Burton though. Those yeah, my, big, those my, those my huge in Vermont. Vermont. Yeah, yeah dude, Bodie <laughs> Merrill, Post Malone. These guys swear by those things. So I know I do too, man. I've and been like, a hater. I need to try these things on, see what's up. Oh, I was an active hater, dude. Me too. And so, yeah, um, no, snowboarding, I don't really, I don't really have any regrets. I mean, there, things chisel at me, you know, but honestly, it's mostly trick based. It's like, yeah. dude, I should have put in more, you know, I was there. I should have put in more. Looking at your career over the years, because I've been around for the whole thing, man, it's got to be one of the most impressive things. You and JP, what you have done and the parts you put out are in my opinion the biggest that no rider's really done it on your level for as many years you know what 21? i mean 21 is that what yeah, you said there's yeah, guys 21. that are around and you know they throw wicked tricks and they got awesome style but they haven't put the parts out right so to me it's the most impressive thing you shouldn't have any regrets it's well, it's amazing you, what thank, you've done yeah thank you thanks for that and you know that's that's my accolade. Like if, you know, I, you get asked that a lot. What are your accolades? Cause that's what people want, you know? And I'm just like, 
I filmed 21 video parts for 21 years in a row and I didn't miss a single year. And that's, Incredible. that's my stat. And it's really the only one I'm proud of. Um, well, I shouldn't say that it's the only one that really means a lot to me because that was, that was me, you know, and the people that supported it, um, and just kept allowing it to happen, you know, like I just, I, I feel, I'm just so stoked that I was able to do that, you know, and it wasn't an intent. It just, I never filmed a two year video part, never dropped into that thing. Always wanted to, you know, it could, that stat could not exist because of, yeah. Someone could have approved that two year video project for me, you know, but yeah, I mean that, that became a thing once we started, you know, 15 and start, you know, I'm like, Oh, this is looking like kind of a tally here. Let's, yeah. you know, and then you start paying attention to it a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. No regrets, man. It's well, been a good ride. Great. I kind of want to go back to what we were talking about earlier. Now, you know, talking about where you're at with snowboarding now, Correct me if I'm wrong, where you kind of unofficially like taking a back seat. Is that what you're saying a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I just, I, you know, I'd like to see, you know, if, if, you know, let's go to, let's, let's just dive into it. Let's go to Reed's podcast that you guys did with him. Dude is funny, man. <laughs> and like he threw out that old heads thing rolling on the floor. That was so good, dude. And, and, and so on point, like, it's so true, dude. That's what the cycle is, right? Like you get the dudes that rise up. Um, and then you get the heroes and then you get the grandpas that are just like, dude, really? Dudes are still making money. So there's this cycle, right? And then Every, everyone's got to just like bow out eventually. And I think that's the phase that I'm at, like bow out and make some room, you know, not that the room's not there, but just say, look, you guys dance floor is yours, babies. <laughs> Let's see what you got. You know, you're going to talk all that heat. You're going to throw old heads out there. I'm backing it. I think it's super funny. But I know people are hating on that thing, you know. I know people are tripping. I know people are taking it personal and saying, they might as well have just said my name, you know. He might as well have just called me out. Mm -hmm. And it's, but to me, you're like, well, there you are. You know, you're so self-based and so into your own thing. You think he's talking about you? Dude, he's talking about everybody. He's just putting it out there. Like, this is the cycle, right? And so, I agree with him. And so... Yeah, I just, I think it'd be cool. And I'm just, yeah, not, I'm still around. I'm around snowboarding, 100%. I'm not going anywhere. You're a lifer. I'm a lifer, dude. And if I can film some, if I can film for the life of me being a lifer, then I'm going to, for sure. Even if it's me on my phone and my homies filming me and putting together my own little video part that no one ever sees, just for myself. Like, I do that. Like, I have video parts on my phone you know, like I have a mountain biking video part of me on my phone and well, it's in edit mode in iMovie on my phone, but no one will ever see it. I'm not going to drop it. You know, it's like, I just love that process. And, and I think that's, what's so cool about these dust box kids and me looking at it. Now I get to look at it and be a fan, you know, look, dude, like I don't have sponsor obligations that are telling me I can't wear this shirt in here. That feels super good to me. I haven't had that in, you know, 25 years. I haven't been able to take that road. And and I love being able to do that. But also, just going back to what you were just talking about with this this mountain bike part to kind of pivot. Um, okay, you're 44 years old. You're 44, and you still go to the gym every day and are a fucking animal. You still go ride your mountain bike. You're trying to learn 360s right now. What? <laughs> Dude, he's, yeah, on his Instagram, I saw him. <laughs> Jeez, I kind of got, got paid a little bit, but we'll get it. So, it's coming. so, dude, like, where the fuck does his motivation yeah. come from at 44? And you don't have to do it. And it's like, I, I love it. I just don't see any other way, man. I don't know where it comes from. Um, and I don't even see it as motivation. Like, mostly I'm looking at every single day and... And it's almost a failure because I'm just like, dude, all I did was look at my computer 
and do emails and have Zoom calls and like, where am I getting it? I got to go get it, you know? And then I don't know. I don't know what it is. I can't, I just can't go home empty handed, you know, like if I'm driving home and there's snow on the ground and I have my snow skate in the car and there's a double sided red curb, like phone is set up and I'm sliding the double right sided red curb. And I'm, I only have 15 minutes, but I just want to get a piece, dude. And like, to me, that's living. To me, that's just where I want to be. I, I don't have an answer for where that comes from. I think it's, you know, maybe just being so hooked on this process of, of videos and that, I, I don't know, I just got to get some, dude. And I just think, and it's meditation, dude, by myself, especially. Like, I can do so much of the stuff by myself. And the phone becomes, like, not everything's posted. Most is not posted. But... The phone, you know, it almost, it supports the reason. You're like, okay, I'm getting it. But I kind of, and and I just like to watch. Like, I know why I didn't do that 360 on the bike. And it's just chewing at me nonstop today. It's been chewing and chewing because I know what I can do to fix it and do it right now because I've watched the footage over and over and just the clip. I'm like, okay, that's why I filmed this. So I can do it better next time and understand what I'm going to try next time. And there's no one there to tell me, you know, JP is not saying you need to do this. Um, it's not Chris in the gym, you know, telling me, no, you, you look solid. Like you can stack another 20 on there. Like you're, you're strong. You didn't flinch. You know, I don't have that when you're by yourself, you don't have that gauge. And so it, it sort of becomes, you know, set yourself up for, success the next time you go out and just put some knowledge in there put some tweaks know what you're gonna try I don't know it's just sort of I don't know man I just like it I like doing it I think it's ingrained in you after 25 years of yeah maybe deep, you know pushing yourself chasing and, the clip high. yeah chasing yeah, the clip chasing addict clip. you need it yeah total clip addict what I if, mean there's one thing I'm addicted to it's for sure that clip you eye. know what I want I would love to see is like uh you know, like you see like a, an AA meeting, right? Yeah, a bunch of people sitting thinking. around a circle <laughs> in chairs and they're addicted to getting clips. Oh, man. And they're now like, we you know, make a skit. Like, like Scott Stevens <laughs> is in there and he's like, uh, you know, I was supposed to supposed to take care of my uh, baby today, but <laughs> I had four extra minutes and I ran out of the trampoline and I got a 360 flip on camera. Well, dude, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. And there's seriously some trauma with that. Like, there is, No dude. joke. Like, we would need a serious 12-step program yeah. to break that down and, like, un- unload from that because, like, you, you just telling me to not think that way? I, I, I mean, How? How? It's, it's ingrained I don't, in your I soul. I do not know what the first step would be to approach that. The first step I is admitting don't. you have a problem, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is the first step. Is it? <laughs> so, yeah. So, there you go. <laughs> to me, it's not a problem. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's no, it's not. It's, it's a, a good problem. It's a good problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's so far from being a bad problem that, yeah, me admitting that is not going to, you know, and... And then what's the next that you got to, you got to admit there's hand a higher it, you power. You got to hand it over to a higher power. Yeah, yeah. And hand over me clipping up to someone else. <laughs> no. I don't think so, dude. You don't know what's in my head. I don't you think so, You know, you do dude. your, you do your way. Like I'm do my way. Well, th- this brings us to our guest question. Once again, presented by Solomon Snowboards. Like I said earlier, pick yourself up a sleepwalker. If you're looking for a good cheap board. Gazmi kills it on that thing. Mm, Gazmi's a boss. He is. Let's, mm-hmm. let, let's, Buttery. let's go ahead and give him an air horn as well. Yeah. Like and that. let's get into guest question number two from none other than the Lizard King. Ooh. What the fuck is happening to my this bomb guy. hole family? Put the passion in the air and let it loose. You got big daddy Jeremy Jones in there today. Jeremy fucking Jones is what we like to call him. OCR, melt your dick off, put the passion in the air and let it loose. But Ricky, let's Edge. let's get down to the nitty gritty here, okay? When is fucking Jones gonna land the backflip on his bike, okay? He sent me a video in his underwear, full face helmet, pops out of nowhere, hits a ramp, does a backflip into his pool. When are we gonna commit to dirt? When are we going full OCR, dude? When are you gonna go fucking melt your dick off and land that thing back two wheels to the dirt, baby? 
Well, there it is. When when are we airing this? How many weeks do uh, I got? We're like six weeks ahead right now. Yeah. All right. By then. Wow. Let's just say it. Yeah. Okay. All wow. Right. I so, mean, dude, if he's going to call it like that, like we're committing. You're you committing. Know? Yeah. I it's mean, it's just ingrained in you, dog. <laughs> and, and just the same, like that thing's been stewing in my head. I did take a break from it with the 360. I've been kind of pondering that one for a bit. And so it sort of. But the backflip's easier. Backflip's easier. <laughs> straight up, dude. Like I, I'm like, I should have just flipped that. It would have worked. <laughs> To, to back but up, it's scarier for some it reason. Seems scary to me. Yeah. To paint a picture of a true clip addict, though, I've seen the clip, clip that you, addict. Uh, of you backflipping into your pool in your underwear on your bicycle. Mm-hmm. And you're 44 years old. And your wife is filming you. <laughs> like that is like that is just a stereotypical forty-four-year-old clip addict right yeah. there. It is, it is a prime. Yeah, I mean straight up. But you know what, dude? Who else is doing it? Like we got to pave some waves here. You know, mm-hmm. like let's open up some lanes, show people what's up. <laughs> Old dudes can get it. You just got to find a new lane. I like how I Lizard just changed the whole tone of the episode with his language. <laughs> also, he, he throws in so many taglines yeah. and like uh, put the passion in the air, let it just loose, a, melt your dick off. He's basically a cartoon speaking character. a different language. Yeah. Oh, man, I know. <laughs> what and, a great question. Yeah, that was a good question. And, and yeah, man, you got me committed. I'm in. Lizard, you'll be the first to see the clip. If he lands it, we will have the clip for you playing on the screen right now. There's some heat now. We're doing it. We got it. If not, we'll insert the bail. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One of the way, other. we're inserting yeah. something. Something's some going in- down. Insertions. Well, going back to Lizard, he kind of, uh, if you haven't seen Lizard's episode, it's a it's a phenomenal, phenomenal, oh. one of our favorites. And he uh, talks about the Ollie behind you at Rail Gardens. Mm. And mm. he kind of throws a couple jabs at you and kind of says you were mean to him. We would like to hear both sides of the story yeah. on this. Well, what's mean to a nine-year-old, first of all? <laughs> like, when you're an adult and you're talking to this nine-year-old that has a dope kickflip, and, like, what's mean, you know? Let's establish a, a level ground here. And, but, yeah, I mean, you know, don't try and make a name for yourself by doing some, like, rebate of something that's already got a cover, you know? Like, dude, you already have a kickflip. Clearly worked for you. You should have just stuck with that, dude. Don't let don't get distracted by snowboarding or some snowboarder. Now I don't have a lot of crap to talk on him because <laughs> he's just I've always been a fan, you know. And I've always tried to give him and his mom advice. I'd always run into him at Milo and give him advice and cause Liz is just hype, dude. He wants to just do the thing. And so if you came to Lizard with a deal back in the day, he's all about it. No matter, like, I'm not even reading that thing. Andy's got my deal right here. Let me look at that thing. <laughs> Dude, really? They're going to make pants for you and they're not going to give you any royalties? Mama Liz, sort this out for this kid because that's <laughs> not cool. You know, so just kind of that role. But yeah, no, I mean, no joking aside, that dude at nine years old, we knew he was up to something you know, warp tour skate contests and that dude shows up and, and puts on a show, you know, with good style and, and animated just as he did in that question. Like that's, that's how that dude lives. It's pinned ton of respect. Let's, he needs a, he needs a damn, let's give him a gunshot. He's getting a gunshot. All right. He gets a gunshot. I like the gunshots. (laughs) Okay. Well, this is a, this is a heavy, this is a heavy deep dive. We're going to, we're going to fucking change gears right now. Um, but it's, I don't want to call it the elephant in the room, but it's kind of something that it's been talked about on the podcast. It's uh, Seth, if you haven't seen it, watch Seth. He does a detailed uh, depiction of the avalanche that you were buried in. And uh, we'd love to hear your perspective of that experience. And, yeah. All right. Everyone. Well, I'll, I'll start by, you know, just saying... 
go back and listen to T-Birds. Um, go back and listen to Seth's. Uh, both really good. Uh, moving on to Seth's, he was, I mean, it was phenomenal. Like, the his his story was on. Um, there was a main thread, very common thread through this whole storyline. Uh, but there was 10 different people that have a different perspective of it for sure. And, you know, mine was much different than Seth's. Seth's was one of management and control, um, a clear head, you know, to be able to make decisions. Um, and he just sort of had that overview, you know, he was able to look at it all and see all the pieces and helpfully support them into the spots that they needed to be, whether it was people, whether it was terrain or whatever. Right. And so my narrative is one of gratitude because I was in the hole and I was wrapped around a tree. Um, and Brock and Seth were the two people and then everyone else underneath them that got me out alive and everyone else out alive, essentially, you know, because it was problem after problem, as you will learn if you listen to Seth's, you know, and I can go into a kind of quick overview of it from my perspective, but I just think that his his story was so on that it's, it's where you should go first for this listen. Um, my story, real similar, you know, it was a rough morning getting out there, we took a lot of time and I, I, I'll kind of like move a little quicker through the details. Um, but you know, tons of snow, um, and it was wet and it was snow that we didn't exactly get a feel because we weren't even on, we didn't take our first run until one. And that was, you know, in the parking lot at seven, it was still dark. Um, and so that's a long time not being on your board, not being on the snow and not having the snow under you. And growing up at Brighton to give some back context to that, that's where I grew up riding. Um, and with that, I was able to safely start exploring. You know, we would snowboard in Mitch's backyard and then we'd go to Brighton and we'd ride these runs. And then we would see Brandon Ruff over in the rock garden. And we're like, hmm, that looks like we could go there. And then you'd sort of, we sort of just slowly, you know, started making our way past the rope. But when we first went past the rope, we were just at the windlet, you know, 10 feet past the rope. And even that was something. And so we, we actually learned what the backcountry gives you by feel and, and by years and years of doing that that's where we got it. It wasn't like we weren't just these street kids that now are pro or these contest kids that are massive, like ripping contest kids. And then they get put in the back country. Like the snow feels different. You can do the tricks. You can get in the air, just get the dude in the air and they'll do their thing. There's just so much more to it than that. Right. And we learned what that was by feel. And then we put the education of backcountry on top of what that felt like. And I've always relied on the feeling. I didn't have that on this day. Like I was missing what the snow felt like, how it was changing um, through the morning hours. And what had happened was we were inside a cat until one, essentially. We did get out to do some digging and move some trees um, so the cat could make its moves. But we didn't really know what was going on and that snow was heavy and it was a lot. I mean, it snowed in those morning hours, probably a foot of snow, foot and a half. And then the night before was, I don't even know, four feet, five feet, like a lot. And so when we were into our pits, you know, it was giving us mixed feedback because we had really clean cuts. Like I could run my hand through to the ground and not hit one one like question mark right it just was the same consistency my hand would just cut right through no problem and so it was but we knew what we knew it wasn't right right we knew we needed to be careful and so we approached the day that way low level stay in the trees that was our game plan um we did that 
for our first two runs. Our second run moved to a new location um, because we wanted to get on the face that actually slid, right? Um, And so we kind of messed with the side of that, testing that, and the snow felt good. I, I, Seth mentioned someone made a cut in kind of the bowl in his story, and that was me. Like I, I was the first one to drop um, to test that snow. We were staying against the trees, so you know, ideally, that's a better anchor, and the snow is safer, uh, better exit if something does go wrong. So that was my line. I just dropped in, and and the tree that was the farthest out kind of going into the bowl, I went around the the bull side of that, like just inside, just made a heel turn um, and kind of like sat in the turn a little bit and then pulled in behind the tree. And it was, it was fine. Went the red, like halfway down the run, radioed up and, and told everyone else that snow felt good. Um, don't go out, don't go outside of that tree. Don't follow my, my turn. Like the, the council was just, you know, stay inside that tree, come, come down to me. And then we'll, we'll do another leapfrog the next half of the run. So that all happens. It all went well. Uh, we're about four o'clock in the day and now we know that there's a path. So we, we know we can get up to the top of this run in 20 minutes. It was just before four. And so we knew we didn't have a lot of light, but we knew we could get up top. We knew the run was feeling safe to us. Um, and so we went up for another one uh, just because of those reasons. Um, yeah, and then we had looked at this rock that was on the skier's left. Why do we say skiers? What Do we still say skiers left when we're snowboarders? I like to say riders. Riders or left. Or lookers let's left. Let's change that now. Yeah, let's change it yeah, right now. Lookers left, yeah, riders lookers, left. Let's go, let's go with riders. Lookers would one. be my cool. photo vantage point, and yeah. riders would be yours. But So riders left, you know, I we had this rock that Alex was looking at the run before. Um, as a group, we pulled pulled him off and whoever else was showing signs of wanting to hit it. Right. We're just like, no, no, let's stay over here on the right side of this thing and make sure this thing is money before we start sending that obviously felt money. So Alex sent that. Um, he was the first to go. He kind of did a little tomahawk and then he cut across the bull and we had put Mary next to that tree. Um, and the theory there is just to protect her, right? Like, we knew that she hadn't been there that much um, or out in the back country. Her experience was slim. Uh, and we would do that anyway. Um, most filmers and photographers that had been in the back country would do that on their own. We just made the suggestion, you know, stay close to a tree. Uh, we put her at that tree um, right behind it. And Alex kind of cut over that. And then he kind of shacks up with her waiting for me to go. And that, and, so I do it. I do the same thing, a uh, little forward roll right back to my feet, and then I'm cutting across. I don't know if it was below or above Alex's line, but it was just off of his line a few feet, right? And then just dead center of that thing, I just heard just this. I don't, I don't know how to... Man, the sound was the gnarliest part. It was so crazy like just that thunder thunder sound over your house you know when it actually shakes the house but it's quick and it's crisp and it's it's not the rumbling after it's just that crack right I never heard anything like that um and I just that snow (laughs) that dude it was so dope that snow It was like as good as it looks. And then just as quick as that sound happened, I've just never seen snow that gnarly, like that, that fast. Um, but I just stayed my line, my line to, if it didn't crack was kind of swoop over to the tree and then kind of head back, fall line and keep the run going. My line, if it cracked, was to get to the tree. 
So I just kept that in, in play and I just kept my line going there. And, but that snow was so violent, so quick. I could see the ledge, dude. Like the, the crack wasn't that high behind me. I wasn't, I was maybe only 40, 50 feet down from the crown. So there wasn't a lot of heat packing behind me at, at that moment. And as I'm approaching the tree, I can see the edge moving, you know? And so I'm like, I got this. And I just tried to ollie into that crack, like into the like dead snow, right? Wow. That was underneath the slide because I could see it. And just as I sort of loaded that, one of those waves piled up and it just clipped my feet, right? So it put me... Um, I was described as hot tub position, so I'm just on my butt. And then you do what you do, what you're taught to do. And it's just freak out to stay on top. So swimming, um, head up, back straight, just anything, just like start treading water, you know. And then I come under that tree, and I, I still, I'm like, I got this. I Because I'm under these long branches. It was running out maybe 10 feet, and I grabbed a hold of the branch and I just skinned that thing and I just was squeezing it as and that's one of the moments I remember most is I can feel each one of those little pine needles branches that kind of come off of the main branch just popping through my mittens dude as you're going past it slow motion and that that was happening in a hundredth of a second that whole thing you know I mean I don't know how fast it was your mind slows down but dude That was so slow and, you know, to the point of almost hearing it, just like, and the the needles falling on you, you know, like it was that vivid and then I pop off the end just, and then that was it. I was still in it. There was still heat behind me. Um, I just start swimming, took me over a cliff as it took me over that cliff. Uh, the slide that was behind me came over the top of me. And then when me and the slide hit the ground, we sent another fracture. So there was a second fracture that happened there. Just as quick as I hit the ground, I must have hit that tree. I think the tree was, I mean, I can't, I can't really guess, but probably 100 feet or so behind that cliff. So real quick. And then, then I was just peeling back off of the tree. Um, that's what I remember, just like the tree falling away from me. And I was like, what is going on? And then when I, and then I'm sitting down on this rubble, like it's already rubble legs are buried up to my thighs and this tree is sitting in my crotch, literally like I'm just touching this tree. That's probably 10 inches around my boards just wrapped around it. Um, and my legs are buried, so I can't, I don't really know what's going on, but just, you know, it's, as quick as I was like trying to figure out what was going on, Brock, Alex, and Mary were all right there. They got right to me at that point. And, and then I knew I was all right. Like I saw Bryant Brock and I just knew I was good. Like I knew I would be good. Right. And that doesn't mean that the panic didn't happen and the freak outs of, you know, the things going through your head, like, am I snowboarding anymore? You know, um, I can't pay for this. Uh, this does not work for the hustle that I was chasing, you know, like this is not the way to get a paycheck and all that stuff, all that real stuff was just hitting me, you know, cause I was in that phase. I was trying to make it happen. And that was my freak out more than anything. My panic was, just like, dude, I don't know if I got this in me to deal with this, you know? And uh, and not the rest of the day, like what comes after. Um, and that, that was my panic. That's where my head was at. And, and then I started to identify the pain and, and that sucked and just started working with Brock. And then, you know, if you listen to Seth's story, there's he has this navigation of, you know, finding, getting all the beacons off. Um, that was a huge moment for me because I could see in my, 
like cloudy state of really kind of a tunnel vision. You know, I wasn't focused. It's not like a focused tunnel vision, but I had this, this tunnel vision happening. And then it was this fog all around it. And in that fog, I was, people were moving towards me. And I was like, why are all these people moving towards me? I heard someone say, we're missing Mike. And so I'm like, but why are they moving towards me? And then, you know, whether Seth said that or it was my realization or what, I, we realized that my beacon was still on. And so I'm like, this is it. Getting my beacon and I'd got my right leg sort of free. Um, got the beacon shut off and then everyone stops. They stop moving to, towards me and we have no signal, right? So Seth describes that too. We have, it's just silent. And I was like, this is weird. This is quiet. Like we should be hearing some beeps. Um, Just my head's doing that. I'm thinking that. But as I'm digging the rest of my foot out and then I got my right binding undone and I went to put weight on my right foot because I, it was just about getting my left leg out so that I could go help. That's all I was thinking. And I went to go on my put on my right leg, and and it just wasn't there. There's nothing there, right? Just Gumby. Um, and so Brock just kind of pulls me back, and he's like, "Sorry, dude, you you know, you ain't helping, basically." And so he just stayed by me. Uh, and that quick, Seth found Mike. Like, um, it was that quick. You know, it was inside a few minutes of the thing popping that Seth got Mike out, which is insane. You know, um, five minutes, if he pulls him out in five minutes, that's great because you still have a bit of time um, after five minutes that you can save someone even under the snow, you know, depending on if they get asphyxiated or if they pass out. Mike passed out, thankfully. That's a good thing. Uh, And that's something that I was taught at one of Pat Moore's Abbey classes that I you know, after this is like, dude, if you, if you have the balls and you're buried, just hold your breath and pass out because then you won't asphyxiate yourself as quick and you buy yourself a couple minutes and you're, you're looking at possibly 10 minutes being under there and they can still bring you back. And so that, that was cool. You know, that's a good bit of info. Um, but that takes some training you got to mentally like think that one through for a minute be like what all right it's up to you guys i'm under here here i go you know and just knock yourself out for the sake of saving yourself but you got to rely on your buddies you know and the crew that's there and and there and there's that you know seth and brock man those guys like I'm not joking when I said everything was going to be all right when I saw Brock's face because those are the two people that I've worked with for, you know, 25 years where we've just poked at this stuff and and learned it and took classes and shoveled and dug pits and done speed shoveling tests and worked up at the spot over and over and, you know, do camp nights in the snow and, and, test it different ways you know like let's let's sleep with bag only let's sleep with bag and pine needles under us let's dig to the dirt let's bury coals bury it over the dirt and then let's sleep straight on the dirt no sleeping bag like we've tested all of these things because we knew one day something was going to go down like how could it not when we're out there that much you know and it sure enough did and man there's but from there, it was like, it was thing after thing. Like, we had to splint the legs, and then we had to splint the other leg because my left leg was a little bit attached, so I had some sort of pull there. I could kind of throw my legs around if I used my left leg. So after the splints went on, and we got the powder board under me, I told um, Brock to duct tape my legs together because I can throw. I'm like, if they're duct taped together, then I can actually use them. I can be a monopod, but I can use it, you know, to some level and help them out a little bit more. And, you know, he, they backed me out of that, dude. They backed me out of that rubble for like a quarter mile. 
And that, dude, that's some shit. Like, watch just staring at those guys in, in their face. Just knowing that they're saving me. Man, you got nothing there, you know? Like, you can't do anything. Um, except say thank you. Thanks. I know this sucks for you. Thank you. I know this sucks for you. You know, Brock, office man, he didn't go pro with us uh, to the level. He stayed homies. He would he would be with us all the time and out with us as much as he could, but he didn't have the, he wasn't prepared for that. You know, he's office bod and he's backing us out of that. And I know it killed him. You know, I know it killed him. I know his back was hurting. Um, he didn't have gloves on. He didn't take his hands off the nose of that board. And then we get to the cat, um, Eventually get in the cat, uh, start driving. There was a couple little hiccups there too, but then the cat breaks down and that becomes a major hiccup. Like one, we're not sure we can get past, right? So the nonverbal communication starts happening with me, Seth, and Brock because we can just work that way. Um, Brock stays with me. Seth's managing everything else like he was. Um, and then the decision gets made that he's going to grab my keys and run to my car and get a phone call off because it's just not looking good. It's getting too late. Snow's storms kind of coming in again. Um, kind of heavy. So yeah, him, Mary and T bird did like a two mile sprint, you know, in a foot of snow ish. Luckily they had our old track kind of coming in, but I mean, I don't even know that that served them too well. Honestly, I, I just, you know, either way, their lungs were bleeding. You know, Mary sees a moose. They see moose tracks. They're spooked in the pitch black because there's a moose right there, you know. And don't worry about it. Head down. Just keep pinned. And they did. They got to the car. Um, Seth instructed Mary on the phone calls to make. Uh, they got it off to search and rescue. Seth wasn't happy with the time frame that that was looking like. Got a call off to uh, Life Flight, and they had just took off from the university hospital, the U-View hospital, and there was the storm had broken enough. That there was a hole, and they just punched up, and I think they were they were on the ground in like 18 minutes from that call, so super fast. And then, yeah, uh, two of them came to the cat, started kind of getting me on some drugs, and you know, asking all the questions, all the stuff we had kind of already gone through and me and Brock had been working through. So we're just giving them all that, that download and that information. And, um, Brock's, you know, educating them on drugs and what, what to give me and how much to give me. And they're like, how do you know so much, you know, <laughs> cause Brock's like, he loves that stuff. He just loves knowing what those tolerances are and he geeks out on it for some reason. And so he's having these like narcotic conversations with the um sir, he's what, prescribing your mouth yeah and basically <laughs> and they're like how do you know so much about this he's like don't don't worry about it don't worry about it <laughs> you know and so that it was like there was this this funny chatter kind of happening you know and that's part of that whole thing is like we were able to make these jokes inside all of it and that's the stuff that sits with me that's those are the things that i remember like i'm not i don't remember being, you know, near hypothermia in terms of my body feeling it and like my brain saying, yo, you're about to check out. Um, you need to figure something out. Cause I was like, I ain't checking out. Like as long as you're right next to me and going to go through this with me, then I'm not checking out. That was my brain. And that's where my head was at, you know, but Seth Brock, they're looking at me like, this is our homie. We got to get we got to get him out quick because this stuff's going to set in no matter what, what kind of person you are. Like it's going to set in if you're out here this long. And now my legs are exploded. I don't know what internally is happening. Um, I just kept the boots on. I just cranked them tighter, you know, just pull them tighter. 
because that's where the brake is. It's under there. There's no point in taking them off now. And so, yeah, we just, they, they came, helped, got the back, got me on like the backboard thing. And then just as they were pulling me out of the cat, uh, search and rescue had showed up at that point, a, cu- a few of them pulled up on the sleds. And so, which was nice because then there was some good manpower to carry me to the heli. The heli was, you know, hundred, 150 feet away or something. And, and then it just kept going, dude. It was like, then we couldn't take, we take off and we're circling. I'm like, why are we circling there? And they're telling me I'm going to be gone. My, I love like seeing how long I can hang when they give you drugs. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you're going out for a surgery, okay, count to 12. And I'm like, can I count higher? Cause I'll count higher. <laughs> and I'll, and then when I wake up, I'll tell you what I counted to. Really? Oh Yeah. And I'm to 17 now. Wow. And that was the most recent one. And, and like, so, and that was this, the second surgery I did when I got some screws out, but go in, you know, and and the lady's like, you, you're good now in the heli. You're good. Uh, you won't remember any of this. And I'm all ask me when it's over and I'll tell you everything from the heli ride. And I don't remember everything, but I remember circling around. I'm like, why aren't we going? And then we start following a car down these canyons. It was so awesome to hear Seth say that, to actually him, him getting a visual of it, because no one's really backed my, my, vision of up, my vision up on that until he said that. And so I was, that was rad for me because I, it's clear to me. I'm like, I know we were circling. And then all of a sudden we were following, we were super low following a car and then we followed another car down Provo they couldn't get me to IHC is where they were going to take me so once we get to Provo hospital that you know I was done then I'd kind of checked out I don't remember going from the heli uh, into the hospital I remember landing but I don't remember anything else and then I wake up and that was kind of when my final checkbox ish sort of checked and I was like okay now now we're good now we're safe and I mean I knew we would get there like I said because of Brock because of Seth um but yeah when I woke up and my wife and GP were at the foot of my bed and then I was like all right we're good like I can pump the brakes a little bit and you know probably broke down at that point um and just tried to stew everything down and make sense of it and and then the PA just comes on over and he's just like so what do you do and like I'm pro snowboarder and well you're won't be doing that anymore and I was like dude right then and there really like I'm I don't know where I'm at yet and I was like, why not? And then he, I have the, like a portable x-ray machine to my right, and he starts pointing out my x-rays. He's like this. It's all exploded. It's just not, it's just not working. You're not going to do it anymore. And I was like, well, I think you're wrong because, first of all, you just explained to me what my left leg is while you're look, pointing to the right leg x-ray. So I think you're wrong. And he's all, this isn't your right leg. And I'm all, that is definitely my right leg, dude. What's the R for on the x-ray or on the panel thing? And he's like, he's like, oh yeah, this is, this is your right leg. Well, you know, and, (laughs) and I was like, dude, how am I the one that has it? How, how am I the one that's more put together at this point? Like coming out of all these drugs and, and just spun out. Right. And then, then they just pull my boots off. I was like, dude, cut those things off. Do not pull those things off. That's going to kill. Because they shot the x-rays with the boots on. They pulled those off. <laughs> that hurt. That was when the pain hurt. Fuck. And then I get up to the room, supposed to get surgery at like midnight or something. And then I wake up to my dad walking in the room at four in the morning. And I was just like, I mean, wake up, I was in whatever drugged up stupor you're in. You're not really sleeping and in a lot of pain. And 
And my dad just drove down from Park City because he couldn't sleep. He knew it was up, but he just, and I I talked to him, but my dad didn't normally do stuff like this. Um, yeah, and he just showed up in the room and just sat there. He didn't do anything. He sat there from 4 in the morning until like 8, which I was supposed to be my my surgery time. So 8 rolls around and still no surgery. 12 rolls around, still no surgery. And then I called, you know, one of my doctors, ortho friends, and they ended up doing the surgery and said, what, what am I looking at? Like, where should I be with this? And he's like, dude, you, you should have those things done within 24. You need that done now. Like this delay is unacceptable. And he wasn't trying to like edge in. And I was like, all right. So I, I hit him. I'm like, I got to go to a different hospital because this guy is now, now is not doing my surgery until five. And I'm like, his reputation, I already don't trust because you've already missed three marks of giving me a time and not showing up. So I need to go to a different hospital. And there, and then they told me I needed to clear it through a social worker. So by three in the afternoon, we should be able to get the social worker in here to interview you so you can leave. And I was like, what dude this is insane and so I just called the surgeon again I'm like figure this out and I told my wife and she she just went to work and then in like 10 minutes the same lady walked back in she's like okay we we're putting you in ambulance at one and we'll get you over and then I was in surgery by eight that night what hospital um whatever that Salt Jordan or something. no it was uh what one is that is that Jordan is it West the like that West Jordan one? That I always one? forget what it yeah, kind of new. Either way, you had the wherewithal to be like, this isn't going down here. This yeah, it's not going three like three check marks on this guy. Yeah, and the, and like he's the best. And I'm like, well, do does he show up? Yeah, you know, because that's part of being the best, in my opinion. And I want someone that will show up at least. Wow. So yes, and then that was it. You know, got there, got. Got all checked in. Um, my surgeon came in immediately. Uh, went through kind of options, which were few, but so more or less just told me what he's going to do. Rod both of my legs, plate in my right as well, and just numerous screws to just kind of attach all the pieces. Um, and so that was it. Went into surgery, told the surgeon to film as much of it as possible because I wanted to see it. And Part of that play is to keep people accountable. I just cool. assume if they have cameras running, they're going to do their best work, right? wasn't that I totally didn't trust him, but I totally didn't trust him, right? And and it was, I think it was effective. Like the his work was insane, what he did. But I just had mess. I had messy legs, you know. And yeah, that's basically it, dude. So from there, it was just rehab dark times and just you know working your way through it incredible so for the people listening that don't know basically both your legs were fucking exploded yeah right? Right. yeah tib tib fib um both legs uh left leg the fib just had a fracture so that one that was what was keeping the left leg intact um and the left leg was the milder break i think it was quite a few pieces in the tib um my right one was tib fib and they both exploded and that, those are a few inches above my ankle so pretty low um yeah big old plate in my fib on the right uh on the outside and then yeah rods rods through the center of both tibs and those go in like a nail straight up the rods do dude I'll send you the footage. I don't want to watch. I it. don't want to see the footage at all. I don't. I'm not. I don't do good with that, <laughs> no. to be honest. Dude, it is so gangster. These dudes have blood just flying all over <sighs> them, <sighs> I and can't they do have it. this nail this long. For those listening, my fingers are about two feet, two feet apart, and they call. You know, they ream it so they take this drill bit just as long, and they guide it through so they core your bone. And then they stick this rod in, titanium nail. It's like running rebar pins in concrete. Kind straight of. up, dude. And dude. no joke, they take this like Thor hammer that doesn't Thor. look any different 
than a, a Home Thor Depot hammer. hammer. Oh, really? Mini or sledge. a Thor, Is yeah. Mini sledgehammer? Yeah, mini sledge. And they, it's just... And you're they, awake through this? Oh, because you have the video. I have okay. the video, have yeah. The video. And then they just pound it in. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> you know, and that, I mean, maybe <laughs> next time for sure. Because, like, I'm curious, you know, I want to know. I am not curious to see anything like that happen to me ever. Yeah, it was, it's rowdy, dude. It's, like, prehistoric. They just pound the nail in. And imagine the learning process of how they got to being able to do this to people, you know. That's it. Just like yeah. that, dude. Let's get in there. <laughs> it and do is it. violent and it's brutal. Like Ugh. those surgeries when you when you come out and you're clapped out, like that's why, dude, because you're you gotta be clapped you're out. You're a ragdoll in there. They do they're not I mean, before they rip me open, I have a photo from my surgeon that he sent me and and he's bending my foot like it's the it's a top down of my right leg. And he's pushing on the outside of my foot with one finger, and my f- and it's a total L. Just, and he's just going like this. Oh, God, dude. dude. Because it's just Gumby. It's Gumby. Oh. You know, and I'm like, dude, this is what these dudes are doing. And, like, I'm not mad at the guy, so don't get me wrong yeah. here. But that's, you, when you're out, dude, it's look, free, look free at, reign. Look dude. at this guy. Yeah. <laughs> they got to get theirs in, too, you know? <laughs> They got to fuck with the patient a little bit. I can't yeah, blame dude. them for that. Yeah. Can't you can't. That. I mean, they put in the work to be inside of there. So, like. They get paid some heavy ducats. I guess they have their moments. Yeah, there's no no joke that you're so hammered when you come out of that stuff. Oof, like, even the smallest surgeries, you get cut open. Like, you get put out, dude. They're yeah. they're fondling you. Like, you're, you're getting handled. <laughs> so, we got a Patreon question from uh, Jeremy Richardson. And it kind of. Maybe not this last injury because I was pretty heavy, but just in your career, dealing with injuries is uh, kind of what it's about. It says, Jeremy, you've been through your fair share of injuries over your incredible career and look to have an amazing support network around you. What's the best advice you have for riders who are dealing with an injury? How do you keep picking yourself back up and motiv- motivating yourself to get healthy and back on your A-game level? Um, good question. Uh, I'm just gonna, I mean, dude, being hurt sucks. Like that's the motivation straight up. Like, do I want to be here or there? You know, I mean, we know what it feels like to not be hurt. You, I hope you know what it feels like to not be hurt. If you don't, I'm super sorry. And you're fighting a battle that I can't relate with. So good luck and, you know, keep grinding. But that's it, dude. Like, I want to be better because I want to do stuff. I want to be on my A game. And fighting through an injury to get to an A game is just a distraction. And it's it's how bad things happen, you know. And and that's it, really. It's like I'm I'm a better person when I'm healthy. And so I just need a find my way there and and also define like what health is you know because it changes um and you you can find health inside certain ailments that stick around I believe that and you can find that kind of peace and and that a game I would say but yeah I it's just I mean the motivation's just to get back to clipping up dude like I'm telling you that there's, you know, any addict will say it, dude. Like, you just got to get back to the drug, you know, and that's it. Like, it's not any different. It's truly not. Like, if clipping up's the thing, then the injury's in the way. So let's get back to it, and that's it. Looking back on the road to recovery with your injury, it seemed like initially when you were rehabbing, you know, your you had your legs were destroyed. You started to be able to walk again. And from what I remember, it seemed like were you hopeful that you were gonna get back to hundred percent initially? Oh, for sure. Not even hopeful. There just wasn't even a doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it was Yeah, not a doubt in my mind. I didn't I'd never had that kind of damage. Um in that location. Um, so I was ignorant to some things, 
you know, what that process is, what happens down there, like the circulation super bad. Um, those tip fibs are notoriously not healers. <clears throat> um, that's why that guy said you won't snowboard. It, it wasn't because he was trying to be a butthole. It was just because he, I mean, that's what he thought. You know, he's like, that that dude's maybe walking. Maybe. You know, that's the way he saw it because that's what he was taught when he was shown those images um, in school. And he was too young, I think, to have a lot of experience with that. And so... That was his comment. And then my surgeon is like, yeah, I'll have you back, you know, and he was playing off of my confidence. So that was almost to my detriment a little bit. Like he could have been, and again, no fault to his, but he could have been a little more less on my side almost, you know, but he, but same time, he was seeing my, my mindset, where I was at, and he was just like, you know what, I'm just going to let this kid go, because if he thinks he can do it, who am I to stop him, you know, and that, I think that's dope, you know, and I don't, I don't think it's a mistake, I think, I think it's supporting, I think it's a, you know, that's what I would do as a parent, you know, my sons got into scootering, and at one point, I had to be like, you know what? Go for it. Be the best scooter kid you can be, dude. Show me what's up with it, you know, and now he's into football. <laughs> and same thing. It's like two things I never wanted my kid into, you know, in not knowing my kid. But now it's that same thing. It's like, dude, football? Really? All right, let's go. How 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 good do you want to be? What do you want to put into this? I got your back. I'm the student. You tell me about it. You tell me what I can do so that you can succeed, you know? And that, I think that's, you know, good parenting. I think it's good mentorship. I think that's a good friend. Um, you know, I, you need to be able to call people on their bull crap too and be honest and say, nah, this ain't right. You know, I, I, you got to be able to do that too. But I don't know if you can't get on someone's side, you know, and everyone needs it. Everyone needs someone on their side, you know? You need somebody to give you hope, too, in that sense, yeah. too. And it's like, don't take the window of that person's sales. But, you know, going for sort of the people that kind of don't know or don't know your story that well, kind of there's this there's this hope to get back to 100%, and then you're going out and you're going snowboarding, and it seemed like your legs just, they just weren't fucking working like they're supposed to, right? And what I wonder is, you know, is this person that has been – a professional snowboarder, their whole career done incredible feats, and then a world-class skateboarder, you know, and you take this thing where your mind can do all the shit. You can still, it's all there, but you can't get your legs to fucking do it. Yeah. Like, how did you cope with that shit? That's got to be fucking torture. dude. Yeah, I mean, it's it's torture <laughs> still. Um, I, I think I'm coping pretty well but yeah those were yeah that that thinking were my dark days for sure you know just on the I had my rehab zone set up in my garage um it was very much alone and it was dark dude it was but it was the way I needed to do it you know I needed to be by myself and I needed to go through that suffering alone you know, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't have my kids see that. My kids needed to see when I get up from the floor. You know, they, they, I didn't want them to see me on the floor. You know, it's where I spent the first year and a half, you know, just doing chain fonda, you know, leg lifts, you know, putting a, tying a ski boot or a snowboard boot to my, but because that was my weight, you know, that's all I could get up. It's all I could lift. Yeah. I, it's, it's torture, dude. Like it sucks to get on a board. You know, I'm riding Burton clickers right now, dude. Sorry for calling them clickers downing, but 
they're still clickers. Every time I step in, it goes <laughs> click. <laughs> like you just, dude, step on. Step on what? Like that sounds so soft and no audio. But clickers, dude, like they click. It's like some ski shit. It's a trigger word for the Burton people right yeah. now. They're triggered. No, but I got on those last year and, you know, it took a load off off of the strap. Um, it's not where I'll end up. I'm so looking forward to putting on normal boots and bindings this year. Um, I'm actually really, really excited for that first day. And it might be a total blowout. Like I might learn in one run or in the garage that the clickers are going back on. Yeah. Right. But it got me on the mountain and I was able to ride last year, you know, to some level. And then that put me in a place where I could now dial everything back. Like, okay, where am I at? Like for real, where am I at? Let's assume I'm a hundred percent. I still have two rods in my leg. I still have a plate that's on my, right leg in the middle of my boot from the top of my boot to the ankle. And there's a lot of flex that happens in the bones right there, especially for the stuff that I like to ride. Like I can ride powder, but powder is the second best thing in snowboarding. The first is steel and I can't ride steel. Yeah. Seriously. Let's give it another. Let's get horn. some. Let's give it a whole, like, orchestra <laughs> symphony, dude. A symphony Let's give the, the steel. steel a symphony. Now you know how we real got, steel feel. We got a steel advocate sitting in the booth. I love it. Yeah, man. I'm like, you know, that's where I want to be. And so how do I get there? And that's, you know, that's where the clickers came in. Um, and I'm just working slow, dude. It's just dialing everything back. All right. Those videos were someone else in a sense. And now I have to look at it like that and just say, okay, that's, I can get motivated by that because I'm stoked on that person's video part. Oh, but that's you. Is it though? <laughs> you know, I, it's not, there's no way I'm going to be able to do some of that stuff, but I can get back on the steel. I can slide some stuff. I can lip some stuff and I'm hoping I can nose press some stuff really good again. And that's, that to me is my biggest hang up right now is like that that metal in there doesn't allow those bones to bend. And when you're pressing, dude, you need that bone to bend. You need the flex that it gives you. And the rods and the plates don't allow it. They don't allow that bone to flex. I'll tell you this right now, though, because we've had some sessions at Rail Gardens this past winter. I saw you out there filming lines, getting it. And sure, the tricks aren't as maybe difficult as they were in your prime. But the excitement for the tricks you're doing and the, the celebrating the small steps is fucking infectious. And I, I would maybe argue that the shit you're doing right now, like overcoming this injury is, is more inspirational to the people around you than the Jeremy that was, you know, was top dog, you know, for a long time. So I, I love watching it personally. I love watching the growth and all that. So Well, thanks. I mean, that's, that's motivation to me. You know, that's, that's like, that just makes me want to go to the rail gardens right now and put something down like truly. Cause you know, I had a couple of days that last year just stopping in and, and you guys were there and it, like, I didn't normally ride rail gardens when those sessions were going, like I wanted to be there alone. You know, that's what I, that's the snowboarding I liked to do, especially with the camera on. I wanted to be like me and the posse and keep it tight, you know? And now I'm like dropping in on these crews, you know, rail gardens and the heat's just going like these dudes are on, you know, like the stuff you guys can all do on those rails on the regs is it's messed up. And I get so pumped on that. And, and it is like, I, I, I get a board slide and it feels good. I am juiced, you know, and it's because I've pulled my level down and just said, you know what, we just got to check these things off. Let's just move through the ranks like we've done before. And just know that that's where you're at. That is where I'm at. And it's, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how far I can take this yet. But I didn't before either. You know, I never knew. I was just trying the next trick that popped in my head. And so, I just a bit of reprogramming so that you go there. And then, you know, fools like yourself out there just murking it. 
You know, that's, that's where I want to be. I want to get out whether I, I'm on the level or not, doesn't matter. But if I can hang, be a part of it, get some tricks down, have a good time, you know, watch some brown groundbreaking like filming going down from you guys. I'm all about it, dude. That's like, that's rad. Well, that's cool. And, it, and it's almost uh, argue, arguable like your feats of what you're doing now and how hard you've worked to get to where you're at. I see you in the gym, dude. Like I see you picking up heavy shit and being super self-disciplined, not missing any days. And it, it's so easy, you know, it'd be so easy to go the opposite direction, right? But it's like, dude, you know, you, you're not going in there for a paycheck. You're not, but you're working. It's like, it almost seems like you're working harder for the love of the game now. And and it's 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 inspiring. So it's it's really cool to see. I think people still want to see you out on the sesh doing it. It's It's more important now maybe than before too. So it's sick. Well, I hope I'm there more. I mean, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to sniff the sessions out now, you know, and that's, it is, it's fun. Like, I mean, it's on, it's uncomfortable, dude, to walk up to that double line and there's 30 kids there. I do not like it. For one, people just give me anxiety when I'm around a lot of people. It's been my career work through. I've always had to kind of work on that and, and deal with that good and, so that I'm nice enough, you know, that not every person thinks I'm a butthole when I, when I leave, you know, I want to at least have a couple of them think I'm pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just getting into that and then knowing that some of them are watching you when you go, I mean, I know not all of them are, they don't care. Some of them just want to, they're just talking in conversation. You know, it's not all eyes on me, but I know that there is an eye on me. And then you know, Griff pulls out the camera. He's like, let's get a line. And you're like, what? <laughs> you know, of course I want to get a line, dude, because I'm a clip junkie. <laughs> so Give why that you, fix? Yeah. Why are you throwing that at me, dude? I'm, I'm like mid detox and you're just winging it at <laughs> mid me. Mid detox. You know? <laughs> and then, and then it's like, yeah, all right, let's, I'm just going to jump you're gonna on You're going to say it. yes. <laughs> yeah, dude. I just mean, like any it, addict would. And it turns you up. It turns you up to a level that, you didn't know you could access, you know, and those that again, that's another part of that whole thing. It's like you get that dynamic, right. And the things are moving and you level up, dude, you know, and you, you, you enter a space that you didn't even know you had access to. And it's awesome at this level, kind of like being so sucky. Like I only have up, mm -hmm. you know, and that's because I've disconnected from what I've done. And, but until I did that, you know, there was nowhere even to go up to, but now I'm like zeroed out and it's, I'm, I have a baseline and it's nothing. I mean, it's clickers, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, that's my baseline and it's like, okay, I got to get out of those. The problem is, is, uh, as you get older, you still always remember how good you were in your prime in your head. Yeah. And it's so harsh because you start to lose grabs. You start to, and the fact that at your age, you're still on steel and you're going to be progressing to these new levels from the start of your injury. It's amazing, dude. Props to you. Dude, thank you. I'm Skip Jones a little yeah, I mean, for that. Yeah, thank you. A lot of people, thank I mean, you. you might be 50 one day at the rail gardens. I mean, I hope people are taking notice and no, watching. I, like this. Unless I'm dead, 100%. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Will, like, and, or paralyzed, I am I will be at rail gardens when I'm 50. Yeah, that's some steel the most because, impressive thing I've ever heard. And that's not that far away, dude. You know, like five years, six years. How, how old did I say six. it was? 44, six years. <laughs> Like, dude. Oldest cab, too. Maybe we could start dude, that going. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. I mean, I'm going to come up on that this year. It's in the, it's on the list, you know? Question. So, you know, we talk a lot in the show about the world's oldest McTwist uh, running, running, um, you know, conversation. A lot of times, you know, people that have been considered Richards, Otterstrom, Turier, should we throw your name in that hat? Do you think you're going to be able to McTwist at age 95? Shirtless. Who's... Shirtless for sure. Let's just do that. Let's just go there. <laughs> There's a new, new. Notch. We'll just call it that. World's but. oldest shirtless McTwist. Where did we land? Who's got the most votes it's, for people the? People are all over the place. I'm. I go Richards personally. I'm Some from Massachusetts. Some people go Chato. Yeah. And then and the so someone the said Terry Terry A lot of Turgies. So the so the question though is, who will be able to do it 
at the oldest age. Yes. I'm not sure. I will say this. Chad, I don't know, man. All three of them should be able to do them as long as they're walking, I would think. As They've long got, as they're walking. Here's the thing. I feel like they're so programmed yeah. for that trick. Muscle memory. Yeah. And <laughs> But that being said, whoever the oldest one is that does it, I'll go do it when I'm that old. <laughs> Love or, it. Or older. <laughs> So that's like, you also, know what I mean? Also, thing to consider, Jeremy doesn't drink, okay? That yep. adds you a couple. That's like Bun- Benjamin Button of syndrome. Yeah. yeah you're, the you're, the you're, kidneys are firing, baby. Firing, dude. I mean, there's a lot. Your skin cells, everything, dude. There's so many years that other people have just ruined their bodies Yeah, with no, alcohol but, or other drugs, <laughs> anything. Yeah, I, I, I mean... Yeah, I'll go in there for sure, dude. <laughs> I mean, I'm one of the old ones. I might as well just, like, dive in, you know? I'm going to say, if there's a world's oldest Switch McTwist, JP, that's a shoe-in. A uh, shoe-in for a shoe-in. him. Just, totally. He gets, he has a walker up to the spot. <laughs> yeah. JP Walker is walking <laughs> up with Pro a model walker. Pro <laughs> model walker. <laughs> just does it. Well, yeah, I want to go deep dive psychology back to what we were just talking about. Ooh, fun. Uh, yeah, we're going to go. Dr. Phil. We're going yeah, Dr. Phil. So if you if you really break down snowboarders, right? You you look at professional snowboarders particularly. In order to achieve a certain degree of success, you have to believe that you're good. You have to think I'm really fucking good. I'm really fucking awesome, right? What is that? That that's your ego, right? That's mm-hmm. kind of your ego telling you you're awesome. And in order for you to be able to fucking cab nine a giant cheese wedge or whatever trick, that's kind of unfortunately a lot of times comes with the trait of a of a snowboard right but if you break down what happened to you with this fucking injury it's essentially just an attack on your ego right it's like a it's like fucking just broke that thing down to like like it just pure form nothing yeah i mean yeah that's what it was but you got to get there still you know it it, it hits you hard, and then there's a lot of sorting and unpacking and dialing in and, you know, learning that it's your ego that shook. And, you know, and that that's where that, you know, pulling off the mantle, my past, and just saying, you know, no, that's not what we look at. That's not where, that's not even what we're going for. Because there's a totally new lane that needs to be ran here. And and that's what it is. It's stripping that ego down so that you can do that. And you, you won't be able to. If you're if you're constantly looking at, you know, what those accolades are up on the mantle, just gathering dust. Like, dude, they're dusty, first of all. Like Dustbox presents the fucking awards. <laughs> yeah, dude. Dusty Rick's up there, just like Let's get out of there, you know, pull it off, dude, and, and like create something else, you know, and, and that's really what it is. It's like, just pull the ego down and, and make it happen. And you have to have a certain level of hubris just to learn those new tricks you're going to be doing. So are you building that back up? Hubris? Ego. I don't know. I don't know what, what hubris is. He's ego? flexing. Oh, is that? Ego. Yeah. I like it. Oh, yeah. We just learned some. That's a fun one. Hubris. 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 Yeah. Um. Maybe, or you just, you know, you just dial in your confidence, dial in what confidence is, because confidence and ego to me are two different things um, when approached differently. I mean, com- confidence that you can do something is, is the reason, you know, like, why else would you do it? So you're thinking it's less ego, more confidence. Yeah. I mean, in, in, at this point for me, for sure. Um, ego can drive things. I mean, shakedown was shakedown was a mix of confidence and ego. You know, there was a lot of ego that was hurt there. There was a lot of ego that said, you can't tell me that, you know, same with the PA that told me I wouldn't snowboard again. You know, the, the ego in me there had me hiking up Brighton after they closed on a powder day, 300 yards, crawled on all fours so that I could strap in and ride down to the 
bottom terminal at Millie and you I crawled on all fours. I crawled on all fours and I spent two hours, you know, the, like if you take a left up hiking up Millie, there's mm-hmm. the little knuckle up there Yep, where it just, where the old, where the bone zone kind of is, yeah. right? That little high point. I hiked to the top of that rock, dude, you know how far that is. Yeah. Not far. And I rode from there in at three months, 14 weeks. And for sure shouldn't have, yeah, you know, but I just strapped in and I was like, cause I told that dude, that was my comment was, I'm like, I'm going to snowboard in three months, dude, you see. So you did it. Yeah. And I just rode that run, you know, and I mean, I have that footage too, just filmed it. So, and, but I didn't show it to him, you know, I didn't show, it wasn't like this in your face thing, but to me that was ego. That was ego driving that, you know, that wasn't passion and that wasn't like confidence, confidence. Yeah. You know, if anything, I had no confidence. It's like, like I'll show this. Yeah. Guy. <laughs> ego was 100% driving that one and it served a purpose, but it was ego driven. I never heard that story. I didn't know you crawled. Yeah, I crawled. It took me two hours. I was going to, I I was like, my confidence going into that was T-Bird was like, I'm going to go shoot Wonder Kicker. With I think it was with Reed and yeah a few other ride kids. It's fun gap. Same. It's fun fun gap over on Evergreen kind of zone. Oh, different jump. Yeah, okay, different sorry to thing. interrupt. Continue. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'll come check it out. This is confidence. I got that, you know. And then two steps on the snow, and then ego kicks in because you're like, confidence is shot because that really sucks. But now ego kicks in. I still want to get to T-Bird. That's my goal still. You told him you would. Yeah, I told him I would. And so let's get there. Um, I didn't even come close. I mean, that's halfway up Millicent. Yeah. That wonder that's kicker. kind of far. I didn't even come close. And then, but ego kicks in and it got me where it got me. And then it served a different purpose. But, you know, I mean, confidence lured me in thinking, I got this. It's 14 weeks, but you know, I'm sneaking out of the house. Like my kids are at school. My wife was out. I think she was subbing at the school and, and I, I had found out that T-Bird was going up there and it had just snowed and Brighton was closed. And I'm new to this like idea that I have to resist those sort of temptations. Right. That was a new, new thing for me. Yeah. So that I was, I didn't, I'm like, I'm not going to resist. Your wife probably would have been furious if you were shredding. She just probably wouldn't have let me out the door. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? And so I, I just sneak out. I do that. Um, come down to Millie. I'm, I parked right there because the parking was all blown up or whatever. So you could pull almost right up to where the lift line is. Mm -hmm. So I'm 40 feet from my car when I stop and I could not get to my car. Like at this point, I'm like on my belly, like clawing. And I grabbed the, like I had those little runners under my car. I mean, I was gripping those things and pulling myself up to the door handle just to get the thing open and then, and then drive home. Fucking army crawl back to the vehicle. And I drive home and I just pull in the garage, crawl. I have like four stairs up to the door into the house and then your legs hurt so much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of like just on my knees, like sort of, you know, made my way up those. Okay. And then I just go inside the door and have tile and carpet. It's like a little mud tile room for kick your shoes off, you know? And, and then I just collapse, um, half my body on the tile, half my body on the carpet. And that was it. It was out dude, out cold. And then I wake up, uh, to my wife opening the door (laughs) Hitting and you just like <laughs> she, she thought I was dead, you know, oh, wow. she's just like, what? Like it was a, what are you doing or something like that? What, what's going on? Like it was, a, but it was a panic. And so it woke me up and I was like tripping. Like I didn't even know where I was for a second. And then I just, I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I went, I went snowboarding. Uh, everything's fine. You know, just to stew the thing down. And then, I mean, dude, what a cool wife. Like, as soon as I said that, it was like it just made sense. She's just like, oh, this idiot. Yeah. You know, I know why he did this. And and then she's just like, all right, 
and then she just nurtured it, you know, and it, she didn't tell me I was an idiot. She didn't holler at me, you know, for being an idiot. Um, you know, she's just like, you're crazy, dude. What are you thinking? She knows you, right? Yeah. And then she just walked me through it. You know, she's like, yeah, she just nurtured it. And that's, that's amazing, dude. Like that's, <coughs> It's all you could ever ask for. Yeah, props to having Let's give your life, life partner. Life and air horn. Yeah, everyone yeah. deserves Thank a life you. partner like that, man. That's yeah. So what who we call understands you. A ride or die. Ride or die. Yeah, she's she's my solid for sure. Well, also the, the other thing, not to be like there's some also super rad shit that came along with the injury. It's like you can still ride your bicycle and mm-hmm. fucking kick ass. Yeah, if you're gonna be flipping on a bike. Like <laughs> I see you on the bike, dude. The bike skills have not been tainted. Well that I don't know how that ended up working, but you know, I kinda got hooked on the bike just prior to this. And then yeah, I just got that clearance to ride a stationary bike. And I mean, come on, dude. Really? Like, I just knew I wasn't going to do that. It's just a hard thing to really program and commit to. And so I, I had a fat bike at the time, and I was like, well, can I ride my fat bike? And the answer was no. And I'm like, well, if I'm just pedaling, isn't it the same? And this way I'm actually, like, using my brain, too, because i got to be aware. So I just did it, started pedaling just straight, flat, um, no hills and then worked my way to a small hill, you know, one mile, two miles, three miles, and then stayed in three miles for a long time and just changed up the variance of three miles and then got to my normal bike, which was full suspension. And then I could put it on dirt and I was able to do kind of handle it that same level and not, not feel a ton of pain because that suspension would just suck up so much of it, I guess. And so I just worked inside those parameters and that was giving me, giving me life essentially because I was out doing something. Um, I was doing, you know, mentally connecting what my physical was doing. And so that, that to me is just brain work. That's priceless because that that's where my brain works. It works when I'm able to do stuff, you know, and, and if I make it a project, then I'm even harder into it. And so I break everything out into a project. Nothing's like this super long game of, of life. It's like I just have a thousand projects going and, you know, whatever. Ten of them need to be finished ASAP. Twenty of them we start next year. You know, that kind of thing. It's just break it up like that and it works for me. And that's all this was. Dude, it's it's pretty fucking rad if you break it down. You take a forty four year old dude who's got a job now at Woodward, and the place you work has is basically a fucking skateboard park for bicycles. And so you do your shit, you get to go do a whip and tap a tree with your bike, and you're still for no reason at all and no need have a desire to learn three sixties and backflips on your fucking bicycle beast mode. And like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would you say that you are kind of in love with the process? Like of, of the kind of, I guess it's all rehab to a sort or growth, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. 100%, you know, and, and it's infectious too. You know, you see if I can put that energy into a three sixty on a mountain bike, whether I land it or not, Whoever I'm with gets juiced, dude, and they they level up, you know, on whatever level they are. Maybe they're flipping, maybe they're 720, maybe they're just doing a one-hander or maybe just carving a berm, you know, and I just think if if someone's putting in and you can feel that kind of love, then you'll put in too, and that just, it's a good dynamic, and that's I guess all that is, it's just kind of, I don't know, just getting it, dude. Just got to get it somehow. Dude, and you're figuring out what works, too. Because, dude, I saw a clip of you blasting a back tail on a quarter pipe the other day. And was that back a back tail? Was it a back tail? What did you do at Sandy? Do? On Sandy on the high to low. Oh, yeah. Oh, skateboarding. Yeah, skating. Yeah. Skating. Sorry to switch gears. <laughs> I, keep, without... I keep skating so misty right now yeah, because but, I feel that's where I haven't fully, like, But the back tail. Connected. The back tail works. Yeah, man. And that. It's like you got to work. go with what works. Yeah. And I'll. I will say like that, 
That's one of my favorite tricks, you know, back tails and crooked grinds. Crooked grinds is my harder foot. That's my, I got to land on my hurt foot to do a crooks. And so I struggle with that one. I haven't totally let that go. I can kind of do them, but they just hurt too bad. So I don't do them often. Um, but that one hangs on, man. I got to figure out how to keep that crooks from being painful because I want that crooks back in my life. Cause that back tail, I mean, when I, I put a couple down now and it's like, man, it feels so cool. Skating feels so cool, dude. When it doesn't hurt every second, like, dude, it's, it's like, it's everything, man. Like skating's skating's the, like, it's my level. Like it's to a hundred percent my level. I mean, I think biking for what it's given me and I can, I can put in harder there than snowboarding or skating skating. I can put in the least right now. Um, but man, it's the most rewarding. If I can get one smooth push, it, it matters. Like it means a lot. And, and yeah, so that tail, like that transcended some years, you know, it, it put a lot of years back in my pocket and, and a lot of hope. Yeah, we'll put that clip on the screen so people can see. Cause that was a <laughs> that was a fucking salsa back tail. But um, the thing that I'm kind of getting juiced up about is like you know a lot of times maybe the listeners feel the same way right now. But the way I feel right now is I feel a little bit ungrateful for my ability to have a fully functioning body. And hearing you talk about, it, I'm like, dude, what the fuck am I? I'm sitting on the couch like not going skating today. I need to get my ass up and go fucking skate because, you know, it's it's cool. It's like you got to do it for the people that can't kind of thing. As, no, as yeah. cliche as that is, you know, it's good motivation. Yeah, no, I've heard that. Have you guys been saying that a bit on the show, I think? Yeah. Is that where I was hearing Yeah, we've that? said it a few times. Timmy Osler yeah. episode. Yeah, Timmy yeah. Osler started it, and then it kind of resonated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I support that. I think 100%. Like, do it for those that can't, you know. Um, and then, but even outside of that, like... I do that too, dude. I sit down and I don't go out. You know, I make the choice. I can go right now or I can't. And I make the choice not to. You know, I do that too. I, I, do, I do really try to do something every day. I try to get a piece of something every day. Uh, that, I don't know where that came from. I don't know how that got programmed in. But for sure, you know, that's that's top of the list. Every time I wake up, it's like, all right, when's, when's my getting it? You know, when's that fit into today? And how does that fit in? Is it four minutes at lunch? It might be just that, but I'm, I'm getting it in that four minutes, you know, and that, you know, I hear that you've been biking a lot. People tell me that a lot because that's what I post, you know, and I don't really bike that much. You know, I, I get it, but it's like maybe one run. I have that luxury of Woodward and being around there. And so, you know, lately if I'm working all day, I can hop in one run at Woodward before I head home, you know, and I'll throw a clip up of that or something. So it looks like I'm biking a lot, but it was just my one run, just me trying to get it. And I, I thought about the trick all day that I was going to try. And so I'm already there. Like I don't need much warm up. I just got to get things moving because I already know what my plan is and it's just checking the box, dude, <laughs> check it off and, and then start another day. <laughs> so, so sometimes I'll see somebody and they'll be on their high horse and you'll be like that person, they haven't been kicked in the nutsack by life yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And as what we've been talking about and all the things we've been talking about, you know, you lost a really close, like your best friend at a young age, you lost Shane justice, RIP. You've you know, going through that situation when, with Burton, it seems brutal, you know, going really high to low and then ultimately getting in an avalanche and your legs exploding being like the climax of fucking life kicking you in the nutsack. Right. But a lot of times I think that those difficult things that you go through, be it whatever comes your way in life, it comes in all different forms are what forges your character, right? How would you say that those experiences shaped who you are today? Heavy question, I know. Yeah. Loaded, but. You know, they just highlight different perspectives and different weaknesses. You know, 
mostly mentally, like, you know, you, you know, losing a friend, um, man, that's hard on so many levels, you know, however you're connected to that person, it's, that's just rough. It's hard to make sense of that. It's hard to, you know, it seems so empty, like, like that they're just gone, you know, is, is, is a hole and, and it highlights that hole. It's just like, you, you can kind of have an understanding of it, but until it hits you, you're like, oh, this is a feeling. This is actually a real feeling. And I actually feel like there's this gap in my system that's not connected. And so it, it highlights that. And, and then if you're thinking it through and just really working to find your way out, then you start to see what it is highlighted, right? Like, you know, for, for Shane, one thing that high, that it highlighted for me was just that I need to pay more attention to my friends, you know, tell, tell my friends that I love them more, you know, and text my, you know, kind of friends more often and just let them know that I thought about them, you know, and if I think about someone random and I have their name in my phone, then send them a text and just say hi. You don't even need to say anything, but just like, yo, thought of you today, texting you, that's it, you know, and it highlighted that for me, highlighted you know, that I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't as in tune with my friends as I could be. Um, cause I was, I was with him all the time and I was, but I was missing, I wasn't seeing what he was going through. I was still somehow missing that, you know, and that could have been our age. Um, you know, not wanting to talk about that kind of stuff, being two dudes that just wanted to skate and film. We don't want to bring it down with, you know, the things that we got going on that are not rad. And so I just think you got to look at it, find what that gap is, and fill it. You know, with the avalanche, it's rehab, it's mental, it's family, it's friends, it's business. That was everything. That was like everything coming down on me. Um, and, you know, let me rephrase that that statement. Like, Nothing was coming down on me. Nothing was, no one was doing anything to me. Like I was in the situation I was in because I got there. I got there with me, got there with the people that supported me to where I was at before I made that choice. You know, nothing was coming down on me. Burton wasn't trying to make my life suck. You know, they, they're just making a business move and I didn't fit in the model. And it can seem insensitive for sure, especially you know, as a snowboarder, you just get hosed so many times, you know, contracts and all that talk and all that nonsense is you just get hosed, dude. And because that's the game. That's the game. The game's to like hustle in, get a good deal from someone that just is trying to shave whatever they can off because they want to spread it out wherever else they think it can be benefited. You know, like this 10 grand, if I can shave it off of um, Chris's contract, he's still getting paid good, but I can, I can spread this 10 grand and actually get this, this, and this, you know? And so from that respect, it's like, it comes down to how you handle it. How was that situation handled? You know? And like I mentioned before, Knox and Karen, they handled that situation perfectly. Like they couldn't have handled that situation better. They were good to me. They were kind to me. They told me the worst news ever at the time. But they they did it with every bit of love that they could pull up so that it was delivered in a as comfortable way as possible, right? And that that taught me a lot. You know, it taught me that people are looking out if they care. You know, even when they can't do the thing that they would love to be able to do. And I mean yeah. That answer it. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. No, that's it's no, it's beautiful. I, I love uh 
hearing all this stuff, I just feel like a sponge learning. Yeah. I'm, I'm absorbing. And then uh, I, I had another random question that's completely fucking unrelated to what we're talking about right now. Perfect. And it's about Jeremy Jones' Big Mountain. And Fun. you you guys are both, you have, this, you have the same <laughs> name, somehow two of the biggest names that ever come through snowboarding. You got any like fucked up mix up stories from that? Oh, there's some good ones. And I won't share too much because the details get a little, maybe because I don't totally know them, but you guys don't really know each other. (laughs) No, we don't, we don't, we don't really know each other. We know, we know each other. Yeah. We've had some conversations. There's, you know, too many similarities really, um, that just really confuse people. Like I'm still so surprised that people don't know. You know, and like people I'm around daily that don't know. Oh, damn. And you're like, dude, we've gone on way too long for me to even say anything. Yeah. (laughs) They're like, remember, you You know, like if you haven't figured this out, like. Do they think like this is on you person? Like you're Big Mountain and Jib? Yeah. You're just the same. You're the same. It's same person. Yeah. You're the same person. You know, that gets pretty funny sometimes because it's, you know, video premieres or. Dude. And, you know. I loved your, loved your shakedown part, dude. And then also that like further dude was so sick. (laughs) And you're like, dude, (laughs) all right. All right, sick. (laughs) So we've at least like, we've identified that, you know, Jeremy Jones, you know, both of us and you've seen it, but you know, things just aren't totally connecting and, we look kind of similar. We both have two kids that are roughly the same age. We've both been professionals for the same amount of time. Like we've had this career that's really been pretty parallel, you know, and you know, the early years of mine, I was certainly supporting his more where I think his kind of supports mine now (laughs) because his whole thing took off. And, you know, like I get kids asking me, you know, every once in a while, dude, that, what are some Jones boards? What's a, name one hovercraft or something like that let's say Sorry. one's called the hovercraft yeah, i think there's cool names that yeah some pal stick they're maybe asking and, you questions dude that hovercraft sick board man <laughs> good design on that and you're like yeah thanks that's all you can do <laughs> and then other 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 times you're like you know what's the hovercraft <laughs> and they and they like kind of st- uh, what do you mean <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about dude <laughs> What's the, it's, it's your snowboard. Oh, the nitro team. No, it's just a nitro team. <laughs> Depends Wait, what, what mood you're in. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. And the, the, that confusion is just, that's really where it's hard to like pull it apart. And so like, I got almost got in a fight with a guy in Denver, <laughs> like, and this is early, like what set eight years ago, probably now, like this dude was so not in because he was one of these video parts he had a couple of mine and a couple of his and he told me all the things he liked in both of them and i'm like well i got some news for you that might really like bum you out (laughs) and he's like what's that and i'm like we're two different people and he's like what i'm like yeah we're two and he's like oh you're joking and i'm like no dude we're all Two different people. Like this Jeremy Jones rides for Rosignol, O'Neill. Um, I ride for Burton <laughs> time. You know, I'm you know, I like you can go look at the video parts and sort of like see that we're on different product. Dude was not having it. Thought you were lying to him. Totally thought I was lying. I left early because <laughs> he was like steaming up. And I'm like, yo. He thinks you're fucking with yeah, him. Yeah, I'm like, yo, I'm just joking. I'm out. And I just had to peace because I'm like, this dude's getting steamy. Yeah. It's not going to go You're well. You're like, I just need to avoid the rest of this yeah. conversation. <laughs> and then the emails, cro- emails, oh, emails crossing. Oh, here er- we go. Dude. Let's go. Give me something. So these, these are good ones. I'll give you two things. One, I won't go into details because it's with his business. And so I don't want to get get into the weeds there. But he had just started Jones. It was under Nidecker. I don't know if it still is or not. I think but it is. I think yeah. it is. At the time, it was under that. And somehow these emails crossed and I start getting these emails from like the Nidecker side of things. And it was like some heat and I won't say what any of that was, but I was like, 
This is uncomfortable. <laughs> Dilly. Dilly. You didn't reply. <laughs> no, no. Get out of there. Like, I don't want any Escape. part of this Escape. stuff. Like, I don't need to know about the business, dude. Like, and then, yes, snowboards was thrown in there, too, because they were part of it. And there was, like, some. And I'm like, yo, get me out of here. This is weird. Get me out abort. of here. So, yeah, abort that. And then the other email cross was super funny. And this one I replied to, it was... I started getting, there was some heat with Terrier and, and Jeremy Jones and TGR. And I don't know all the backstory, so I won't go into the details, but I get this email from Terrier. And he's like, hey, Jeremy, I'm just calling about this Antarctica trip. Uh, because they were going on some Antarctica trip where they're going to be camping. T-Bird was on that trip. Yep. Was he on that <laughs> yeah. trip? So T-Bird knows. He, yeah. He'll probably know the details. He can correct me, but... You know, it was a situation where they're dropping in for like X amount of days and they had to set up these polar bear fences around their campsite. <laughs> so T's tripping. He's like, yo, what do I need? And they're taking guns, right? He's, he's a European, not into guns. So he's like hitting me up about which gun to get. <laughs> and so I just lay an email response to him like I'm the other Jeremy Jones. <laughs> About all the art, the arsenal he needs to bring. Like, yo, you need these 50 cals. You need this gun. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself with Oh, tea. dude, it was so good. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, he just, he figured it out at that point. But, you know, that was, that was a pretty fun little intervention. And, you know, but That's yeah, those, they cross hairs for sure. told us the whole story about <laughs> the, the, the bears and the guns. So yeah. that actually lines right up. Yeah, they were they were spooked, man. It was that was that was hot. Well, Jones, man, you got any you got anything else you want to talk talk about? I think we fucking did it, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to say thanks. I want to say thanks to you guys for bringing me on. Um, thanks to all the listeners, you know. Thank you guys, um, just showing that love, requesting me uh, means a lot. Like it, it feels good. Um, you know, to me, that's an accolade. I feel like that's something I can actually can put on my shelf where I, I feel like I've done some good, you know? Um, so thanks for all that support. And, you know, all my sponsors, dude, over the years, like all the filmers, photographers, writers, like it's, it's a small community and, and we're all here. Um, Let's just do our best to like rise each other up, you know, cause that's, that's how we're going to survive as snowboarders. It's how we're going to survive as a, as a community is just leveling each other up. Like, let's not get, you know, let's not get hooked up on the bull crap. Let's not get hooked up on, you know, the pain of being an old head. Like you're an old head, you're an old head, dude, just understand it and like play the role, be the part. Usher in the new, dude, and let it ride because the youth is totally the future. It's not me. I'm not the future anymore. I'm my future. I got to deal with my future, and I got to do what I'm going to do. But my kids, they're the future, you know. These dust box kids, they're the future in the street. You know, though, that's what this is. Like, let's let it rise up, and let's let it be. So... I don't know. Maybe that was a little too preachy, but no way. Let's go. Thank you for all your years, man. You are one badass dude. And listen to you talk, man. I think this might be my favorite episode. Man, don't want to call you. it too soon, but thank damn, you. dude, your story, man. Yeah, thanks for dropping the knowledge. Thanks for the inspo. Thank you guys for listening. Heavy. And we will see you guys next week over and out from the bomb hole. Thank you.